It was a bald, wrinkled, almost blue head. Its eyes were huge and white, and as it looked at me, it had a smile from ear to ear that chilled my blood. Have you ever done urban explorations? You see, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not interested in generating content from this, and I don't even want to become famous. I just enjoy getting into places where other people wouldn't go. To tell you the truth, I never believed in the paranormal, and that's not what I was looking for in these explorations. And that's why I can tell you this story, as I spent months thinking I had gone crazy. It all started on a camping day. I had planned to do an exploration of the forest. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was just going to spend the night in the woods. None of my friends could go, but I had no problem with that. It wasn't my first exploration alone, and it wasn't going to be my last one either. Or so I thought. I spent the whole day going deep into the heart of the forest. I didn't really know what I would find, but I knew that there were no animals too dangerous or anything like that, since I always investigated where I go. When I got deep enough into the forest, I noticed that it was starting to get dark. So I made my camp and set up camp in a part that I saw as fairly open and free of trees. I ate quickly and went to sleep when it was still quite early. As the sun was rising before 6 a.m., I wanted to get up early and with lots of energy. I closed my eyes slowly, and before I knew it, I was asleep. When I opened my eyes, I felt something was wrong. I'm not a deep sleeper, but I can sleep through the night if no one wakes me up. And that night, something woke me up. The night seemed normal and quiet, but something was wrong. Call it a feeling, experience, or whatever, but I knew someone was there. Looking out at the pasture in front of me, I watched as something moved unnaturally. The wind wasn't blowing and it didn't seem to be an animal. Someone was watching me. It's not the first time I've been in danger, but I've never encountered anything like this before. A stalker whose face or intentions I did not yet know was watching me. Faced with this discovery, I did the most logical thing I could think of. I grabbed my flashlight, a knife I had at my side, and went into the opposite direction to where the grass was moving. In that camp, I didn't have anything too expensive. I could go look for it the next day if there was anything left. In one swift move, I took off at high speed towards the pasture and started running as fast as I could. I didn't know exactly where we were, but I had a good idea of it. As I ran away, I could hear someone behind me chasing me, but the footsteps got lost little by little until they ended up disappearing. I walked a little more looking for a place to hide, and that's when it hit me. In front of me was an abandoned building under construction. It was strange for all the things outside. It looked like a hospital. But what was a hospital doing in the middle of nowhere? Why was it abandoned? Whatever the reason, it was a good hiding place from whoever was still walking near me, so I decided to go in and hide until I was sure this person wasn't following me anymore, or just that it would be daylight. Once inside, I realized that the place was fuller than I thought. Why would they leave a place like this half-built? I explored the abandoned hospital, trying to get as far into it as possible. I wasn't really afraid of what might be inside the hospital, but it was the man who was stalking me outside that really terrified me. Behind a closed double door, there were lights. How was this possible? How did the energy get here? Why was it coming? Where was I? I admit that curiosity got the better of me and I walked to the door. Once I opened it, I was met with a new surprise. Behind the closed door, there were no people. There were no guards. And they were not performing any experiments or anything I could expect. It was just a hallway with light. I walked a little inside this corridor considering going into one of these doors to hide. If that person who was stalking me saw this place, he would surely think there were guards and would not want to enter. I walked in with a big smile, thinking that the worst had already happened and that surely this person could not do anything, when something in front of me made me stop in my tracks and fall to the floor with fright. One of the doors to the lighted corridor was open. Behind that door, there was no light, just gloom. 
Normally, this would not be the striking thing. The whole hospital except that room was dark. What really surprised me was that behind that terrifying door, someone was peeking out. For a moment, I thought it might have been a guard. It could also be my stalker or a simple homeless person who was living in the hospital. But no, this was something much worse. I will never forget how I felt when my eyes came face to face with, with whatever that was. It was a bald, wrinkled, almost blue head. Its eyes were huge and white, and as it looked at me, it had a smile from ear to ear that chilled my blood. I didn't know what this was, and it was the most terrifying thing I had ever seen in my life. At that moment, the first thing you think of is to run. Run as fast as you can and leave it behind. Would you believe me if I told you that I didn't? In that situation, I was so scared that my body became totally paralyzed, falling to the floor in panic and possibly victim to whatever it was that was in front of me, looking at me very calmly. As if knowing that I could not move, that being came out the door and walked slowly down the hallway towards me. His body was tall, gangly, and skeletal. His bones seemed to be disproportionate and senseless but he still walked towards me without any problems. What struck me most was the way he walked. I'm still terrified of thinking about it. This being, the steps of this being were irregular and difficult, as if it was suffering every step it took. It was strange. It was walking like any other person, but something about that walk seemed forced. It was as if that thing that was coming towards me was trying to walk trying to be human, trying to make me think that I could be calm because I had another human in front of me. Seeing something so horrible filled my body with energy, and instead of using it to fight this being, I used it to run. I ran and ran and ran. I was so desperate that I didn't realize that I was still in an abandoned place. Since I entered, my life never stopped being in danger not by ghosts, psychopaths, or accusers, but by myself. As I was escaping from the being in that hallway, I fell down the escape hatches and ended up on the floor below. My body hurt a lot, and it was impossible for me to get up. But even so, I made every effort humanly possible to get out of that area. To keep going down the stairs and get out of there as soon as possible. But it was no use. Because of the blow I had at that moment, it was impossible for me to keep my concentration enough to keep from fainting. And so, as I closed my eyes and saw something or someone crawling near me, my eyes were much heavier than before. And when I closed my eyes, I fainted. When I woke up, it was already daylight. My body hurt a lot, and I still had the wounds from falling off the ladder. I went back to check the area that was lit, but now, not only was there no light coming from under the door, but the door was locked with the chains. To tell the truth, it didn't bother me much either. Anyway, I had no plans to set foot in that area again. When I managed to escape, the first thing I did was to tell the police everything. Once I did, they all told me that what happened to me at the hospital was probably a lie, the results of my nerves being harassed. It could even be the development of a mental illness that made me hallucinate. Whatever it was, I was sure that what I saw there was real. What the police were able to discover was the information about the man who was following me. Apparently, he was an ex-convict who had escaped from prison. This man never planned to hurt me. But he surely would have, if necessary. Luckily, the police caught him a few meters after he ran into me as he just kept running in a straight line. I still wonder what happened that day. Honestly, the older I got, the blurrier the whole story became. Let this be a lesson. To remember, there are things beyond human understanding. Today, I'm afraid to go camping or to hospital. And I know that no one can judge me for it. The only thing I hope is that no other explorer ends up in that scary abandoned hospital again. Maybe I survived by being lucky, but who knows what that thing might do to the next person who walks in.
Hello everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. There is a misconception about actors. Everyone thinks that once we start acting, a world of luxury and fame awaits us if we have enough talent. The truth is that the world of cinema is ruthless and only a few manage to become famous. Sometimes it is because of the innate talent that the great figures have. But other times, the best actors are left behind and only those who are lucky or have contacts make it to fame. In my acting days, I don't know if I had the talent, but I had no contacts and definitely no luck. Or, yes, maybe I had some luck, but not the kind of luck that leads you to stardom. But I was lucky to be alive. That day, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and sometimes I really don't know how I'm here to tell that story. Let me tell you the story from the beginning. My name is Alan. And along with my friends Elsa and Clive, we made promises to each other that we were going to be famous actors and we were going to do it together. We were all very supportive of each other before an audition, and most of the time, we were unlucky. The most we'd ever managed to do was work on a few commercials or do extras. We had never worked together until that day. That day, the fact that the three of us had been friends interested the director of a small independent film. He sent us an email saying that he was very interested in us. Since being real friends, we all fit together for a small project he had planned. A slasher movie about a killer ice cream man. The three of us were really excited. This would be our big debut in a movie and a horror one at that. Our favorite genre. We had always dreamed of this and no matter how the movie did, which we knew was a low budget film, we would be happy. Or so we thought. We met the director a few days before. He was a quiet man with a very low profile. We didn't imagine him as a person who would make horror films. But you never know. Horror is a very curious genre, and it didn't surprise us that the quietest people can come up with such terrifying ideas. He showed us the film set. The ice cream man costume, everything. He seemed very excited about his movie, and I must admit that, as he excitedly told us about it and handed us the script over coffee, we got a little bit of his excitement. We slept in a cheap hotel room and took the opportunity to practice our scenes. The first scenes we were going to do was going to be inside the basement. Already being victims of a brutal ice cream man who was going to kidnap us and torture us to death. Since there were three of us and the director planned to have four friends in his movie, he hired another external actor to be with us. We hadn't met him yet, but that day, he would go before to film other scenes, so we would surely meet him there and we could coordinate to get together another day. Who knows, maybe he would end up becoming friends with us too. We went to the film set. These shots were going to be in the director's basement, where the psychopathic ice cream man would kidnap the victims and execute his tortures. When we entered, we were greeted by the director. Before we went in, he offered us something to drink to take with us, but we all declined his offer. We were really anxious to go to the film set and see the magic happen. We entered the basement and the image we saw surprised us. The ice cream man was really scary. He was dressed as an ice cream vendor on the table. He had a huge pot of ice cream. A young man was sitting there trying to scream in panic without success as he had something that was supposed to be ice cream in his mouth. We all thought it looked very real and were impressed. Until everything became even more real. As soon as we walked in, the actor who played the victim looked at us very scared and crying. He was acting really very well. But why was he looking at us? We were not in the scene and this was not part of the script. Suddenly, the director came in behind us and closed the door. The ice cream man kept 
shoving the ice cream in his mouth, squeezing it inside and forcing him to swallow. This was not normal. The ice cream man seemed to be really hurting the actor. We quietly asked the director if he was being too rough, but he just smiled without looking at me. The man's muffled screams intensified. I could tell he was trying to resist, but he couldn't, as he was tied up. Something in his desperation seemed all too real. Wondering if this man was giving the performance of his life. When suddenly something happened that made us realize what we had gotten ourselves into. While all these scenes were going on, we noticed that a camera was on and filming us. Part of me wanted to believe it was doing it for the bloopers, but no. This was really happening. This was really happening. There was no way an actor could take what the victim was taking. That man was not acting, but an ice cream man was really forcing him to swallow ice cream without letting him breathe. My friends and I arrived at the same performance, and my friend reached out to open the door, but it was closed. The director noticed this and called the ice cream man who stopped attacking the victim and approached us. At that moment, everything came to light. The director, laughing, said that there was a small change in the script. He said that the movie he really wanted to shoot was about young actors who wanted to become stars until they got into the wrong movie. A movie where they weren't really going to play victims, they were really going to be victims. At that point, we panicked. We all tried to bang on the door and open it but it looked like someone in the back was jamming it. When I turned to confront the director, I noticed that he had already taken quite a distance, and the one standing next to us was the ice cream man, who grabbed Clive with one hand and began to choke him with brutal force. Elsa and I tried to stop him, but it was impossible. Suddenly, we were surrounded by other men who were holding us from behind. The ice cream man continued to choke my friend with one hand. He resisted as best he could, he kicked him, tried to hit him, even tried to bite him, but nothing worked. He had less and less energy, until he gave up, and when he did, the huge ice cream man made a strong movement with his hand, which was accompanied by a horrendous noise. Clyde fell down. His neck had been broken. After that, the men approached Elsa. Please don't hurt us. Please. Don't hurt us. Yes, yes, keep talking. This is gold. I wasn't going to let anyone else get killed in this. So in one strong and surprising move, I broke free from the two men who were holding me and rammed the door open. I made every effort to escape and call the police before someone else got hurt. But behind the door, there were two men waiting for me. They grabbed me and beat me brutally until I was knocked out on the floor. From there... I could only see Elsa crying. The ice cream man slowly approached her. He ordered the men holding her to let her go. He gave her a blow and she fell to the ground. And from there, he began to step on her head. I turned to the other side and did not see how Elsa died. What I did see was the director of the movie who was filming her passionately. No, no. <laughs> After Elsa, it was my turn. The man dressed as an ice cream vendor grabbed me by the hair and dragged me to the side of the first victim, who had lost consciousness and still had ice cream in his mouth. Once there, the ice cream man plunged my head into the ice cream and began to choke me. I can tell you, that was the worst feeling of my life. Not only could I not breathe, but the almost melted ice cream was getting into all my cavities freezing me and causing me the most horrible pain I had ever felt in my life. Breathing became more and more difficult. I felt like I was fainting. What would happen to me first? Would I die from lack of oxygen or from the ice cream all over my head? I had already accepted my fate and had stopped fighting. Until salvation came. The guy who I thought was passed out and was still tied up stood up with the chair attached to his body and rammed the psychopath. Everyone threw themselves at him, and I took advantage of that to recover my energy and run as fast as possible out of that place. They tried to chase after me, 
but I had already taken too much distance. Crying, I managed to get out of the house. I almost collapsed on the sidewalk, crying for help. Luckily, there were police nearby, and before I fainted, I could see them running towards me. If there's one thing I'll take back from that day, is that I fainted at that moment. If I had been conscious, I would have told the police everything I knew. Maybe the young stranger would have been saved. Instead, by the time I woke up and was able to say what happened, it was too late. When the police went to the house where everything had happened, it was empty. They were unable to identify any of the criminals as the house was not even theirs. The victim or the corpse of my friends never showed up either. It was as if none of that ever happened. I moved on with my life and gave up my dreams of being an actor. I knew it wasn't the right thing to do and that these things only happen to one person in a million. But I already had that bad luck once. Who's to say it couldn't happen to me again? Today, I try to live a normal life. I'm afraid of people and I'm very antisocial. Sometimes, I see the ice cream truck pass by my house and I remember that psycho who killed my friends. In those moments, no matter where I am, I fall on the floor and cry. Everyone tells me that I should never get involved with the deep web. They tell me that it is a very dark place and that only bad things can come from it. Some people have even blamed me for the story I'm about to tell, as if I had anything to do with what happened. To those people, I always say the same thing. Do you know the worst thing about the deep web? Even if you don't do anything about it, even if you don't know it exists, you can get entangled in it. You can be its victim. And that is exactly what happened to me. I will tell you how it happened. My story begins on a field trip with my buddies. We were all scouts, and although we were an adult troop, we were only 18-year-old boys accompanied by an instructor. That day, we were just going to untie knots, make a campfire, and tell ghost stories. And that's exactly how the day started. We set up our tents around a circle where we were going to eat marshmallows later in the evening. Some of us were in charge of looking for wood, Others had to go exploring, and one of us, usually the most experienced, would guide us with a map. Our camp was in a remote location, far from civilization and any kind of cell phone signal. This meant we were completely isolated, which sounded exciting at the time, but soon became our worst nightmare. The campsite was near a small stream, surrounded by tall trees that blocked the view of the starry sky. We pitched our tents. When we all returned from our chores, we got down to work and began to prepare everything for the night. A few hours later, we had all the tents ready and a fire going, so we started cooking our rations. The night went on like any other camping trip, with laughter and jokes among friends. However, as the darkness closed in on us, we began to feel a strange uneasiness in the air. That's when we heard the sound of rustling branches in the distance. We all became alert thinking it was a wild animal. The instructor said to wait and went to investigate. We all listened, and within seconds, someone was coming from his direction. But what emerged from the trees was not the instructor. Several men dressed in black wearing masks that hid their faces appeared out of nowhere. One of them held a camera while the other carried some kind of rusty axe. The rest were carrying guns, and they were pointing them at us. We were paralyzed with fear and surprise. The intruders slowly approached us, staring at us through their masks. One of them spoke in a voice that sounded distorted and mechanical. They ordered us to get up and walk toward the stream. With no other choice, we obeyed, feeling like we were trapped in a never-ending nightmare. As we walked toward the creek, the intruders made us form a circle. They stared at us, their eyes hidden behind masks. Then the man with the axe began to speak in a voice that chilled our blood. He explained that we were a part of a macabre live show being broadcast on the deep web. We had been randomly chosen to be the victims of his twisted fun. Our hearts were pounding and anxiety gripped us. 
the man with the camera began to record us, pausing at each of our faces. We knew we were being filmed for an unknown audience in some dark corner of the web. Tears began to gather in our eyes, but we knew that crying would only make our situation worse. The deep web psychopath explained to us the rules of the macabre game we were about to play. Only one of us would make it out of that night alive, and the rest of us would disappear into the depths of the forest. The man placed a bottle in the middle of the ground and began to spin it to determine who would be the first to die. The bottle finished spinning and pointed to one of my friends. The intruders grabbed him and dragged him into the dark forest. I still remember my friend's screams. He was desperately calling for help, shouting that if we all got together, we could attack the men. Otherwise, we were all going to end up dying. You know, I still think about his words a lot. To tell you the truth, he was right. If we had listened to him, most of what happened that night could have been prevented. But can you blame us for not acting? We were only 18 years old. We had never had any real problems in our lives, and suddenly we were facing men from the deep web who wanted to play with us, torture us, and kill us. We could do nothing to stop them. We could only hear our friends' screams and terror fading in the distance. I admit that we all stared at each other. Some were thinking of attacking them. Others wanted to escape. But in reality, we were all frozen with fear. We were all convinced that there would surely be more people in the woods watching us, waiting for one of us to attack or try to escape. Hesitantly, we continued to listen to the sounds of our friends wailing, which would haunt us for the rest of the night. Meanwhile, the man with the axe looked at the rest of us and said that only one would escape. The rest would suffer the same fate. Time passed slowly and panic set in. We didn't know whether to try to flee or stay and wait for our turn to come. Finally, another bottle throw pointed to another one of my friends. They led him into the woods, and this time, we heard no screams. Just an eerie silence that left us even more terrified. As the night progressed, the intruders continued to pick off our friends one by one. Each time one of them disappeared, a sense of helplessness and despair grew in me. I knew that the possibility of being next was increasing, and my fear became unbearable. At one point in the night, none of us thought about escaping. The idea of being the last one alive started to become more and more attractive to all of us who were left. It was going to be harder and harder to resist or escape. We could only play by their rules. Without realizing it, we all became a herd of frightened sheep waiting to be slaughtered. Finally, there were only two of us left, my best friend Mark and me. The man with the ax looked at us with a sinister smile and informed us that it was now our turn to play. He gave us a choice. We could fight each other to the death and the survivor would be free, or we could refuse and face an even worse fate. Mark and I looked at each other with terror in our eyes, knowing we had no choice. The fight was brutal and heartbreaking. We were not killers, we were friends. But the life at stake forced us to fight until one of us lay motionless on the ground. Blood mixed with mud and the sound of our blows echoed in the night. Neither of us was really fighting. We were just two teenagers punching each other and crying. Every punch I hit Mark with was like hitting myself and I could see in his eyes that the same thing was happening to him. You know, I've known Mark my whole life. He was the first guy I talked to on my first day of high school, and since then, we've always been inseparable friends. Mark was like a brother. A brother I was trying to beat to save my own life. If either of us had really wanted to take the other one down, we could have done it very easily. But all our blows were like content. We both wanted to survive, but neither of us could bring ourselves to drop everything. And the axe man knew it. I could see in his face how he was getting impatient, and when the man with the camera spoke to him, he only got angrier. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see how the axe man grimaced and prepared to come at us. I knew what this meant. The fight was boring him. 
In that moment of desperation, I stopped thinking about Mark and thought about my parents. I thought about how devastated they would be if anything happened to me. I thought about my father, who would blame himself for my death since he insisted that I come. At that moment, I closed my eyes and hit Mark as hard as I could while crying and closing my eyes. Mark was instantly defeated, and the man with the axe was surprised but began to laugh. The man with the axe came up to me and congratulated me for surviving. He told me that I could leave. The man not only told me that I could tell the story, but he threatened that if I didn't tell the story, terrible things would happen to me and my family. So I was left to go, alone and traumatized in the middle of the dark forest. I ran without looking back, aimlessly until I found a path that led me back to civilization. I arrived at a police station and told them what had happened. However, the police could find no trace of the deep web psychopaths or my missing friends. The deep web is a dark and mysterious place, difficult to trace. You know, sometimes I feel like I have to do something. Like, look for them and get revenge for what happened to Mark. But inside, I know they are just fantasies. I have no choice but to live like a coward. A coward whose family is alive and plans to keep them that way. My name is Brandon White, and I used to get food from the McDonald's restaurant close to my house every day. A couple of months ago, I walked in to get something and was attended by a new female employee named Mary. She was middle-aged, had short brown hair, and was slightly overweight. While I waited for my order, she tried to get to know me, making small talk. I didn't mind at the time. She seemed nice, and there was nothing odd about our conversation. After giving me my sandwich, I left, not knowing that visiting McDonald's that day would lead to my biggest mistake ever. The next few days after meeting her weren't that different from the first. But as more days went by, I began to notice something strange about Mary. For starters, Mary was always the one taking my orders. This was unusual for McDonald's. To make things worse, the conversations she tried to have with me only became weirder and left me uncomfortable in most situations. She would say strange things like how I looked so sexy and tasty and sometimes ask me questions that no employee should have been interested in. Everything about Mary's behavior was odd. She looked almost 10 years older than me and didn't strike me as that sort of person in any way. Eventually, I began visiting another McDonald's far away from my house, deciding against reporting Mary and getting her fired. A couple of weeks went by, and one day, I walked into the new McDonald's and saw Mary working at the counter. I was shocked and expected her to tell me if she was filling in for someone, but instead, Mary acted as if she'd never left the old McDonald's and didn't address the situation at all. She resumed her usual attempts at small talk and disturbing remarks, but I simply ignored everything she said, got my order, and left. I decided not to go to McDonald's for a while, and only had it when a few friends placed orders at their apartments. I didn't know if Mary still worked there, but I wasn't eager to find out. One afternoon, while walking home after getting groceries, someone suddenly bumped into me out of nowhere and most of my groceries fell. I bent over to pick them up, and the woman who had bumped into me began apologizing as she joined me to pick up the groceries. When I looked up to thank her, I was shocked to see Mary standing in front of me. I remained in silence as my mind raced. Was this woman stalking me, or was this just a coincidence? After standing there in silence, Mary finally said, Well, young man, I'm in a hurry, so sorry about that, and left acting like she didn't know who I was. I brushed it off again as a coincidence and walked home. As I got home, I realized my house keys weren't on me, but I was in a hurry and figured I had probably left without them, so I quickly got my spare key from under the mat, dropped my groceries inside, and left to meet up with my colleagues. My co-workers and I spent a couple of hours getting drunk and playing games on our day off. I left and headed home, but as I opened my door, Something about it felt different. That feeling you get when someone else has been in your home was everywhere. But I was wasted, and all I wanted to do was take a shower. So I quickly looked around and headed to the bathroom. Later that night, I was alone in my living room watching HBO when my phone rang. B.O. when my phone rang. I was curious about who could be calling me so late at night. So I answered with a simple, Hello? 
There wasn't a voice on the other end, but I could hear someone breathing heavily for about a minute before finally hearing a whispery voice say, Come upstairs. I ended the call immediately, assuming it was some kids playing a prank, but something about it felt off, and despite my efforts, I couldn't stop thinking about it and how I felt someone was in my home earlier that day. About three minutes later, my phone rang again, and it was the same number. I simply ignored it and tried to focus on something else. That's when I heard a noise coming from upstairs. I quickly switched off the TV and decided to listen more closely to make sure I wasn't hearing things. Sure enough, I heard a loud noise from upstairs, followed by another, and soon enough, I could tell they were footsteps and someone was actually in my home. I quickly grabbed my phone and called the police before heading to the kitchen and grabbing a knife. The house was silent for the next few minutes, so I began to walk up the stairs slowly to make sure there was actually an intruder. As I checked each room one after the other, I began to calm down and question if I heard anything at all. Eventually, there was only one room left to check, and as I opened the door to the guest room, I was filled with a feeling of relief as all I could see was an empty room. And the sense of relief I had just gotten was quickly overcome with fear. As out of the corner of my eye, I could see a figure standing behind the door. Before I could say anything, the person jumped on me, knocking the knife out of my hand and settling on top of me, pinning both my arms under her. In that moment, all I could feel was terror as Mary looked me dead in the eyes before proceeding to grab the knife I had dropped. Mary slowly brought her head closer to me and began to sniff me, like she was taking in deep breaths. My skin began to crawl and I began to struggle to get free but there was no use, as Mary was a lot heavier than I was. She eventually stopped sniffing me and proceeded to say, Oh, I missed you so much, baby. But you've been avoiding me lately. You looked so tasty today. I had to see you. And well, now I have to take a little bite. She smiled and continued. Now, it'll hurt a little, but I'm sure you don't mind, darling. Mary quickly brought down the knife on my hand, taking my pinky finger clean off. The pain shot through my body, and I couldn't help but let out a piercing scream. Blood began to spill everywhere, and Mary couldn't hold back her laugh as she threw my finger in her mouth and chewed it down until nothing remained. At that point, I had begun to close my eyes as I slowly lost consciousness from the pain. That's when Mary said, No, baby, don't do that. I was just about to have one of your tastier parts. She then proceeded to hold my eyelids open as she lowered the knife slowly towards my eye. Before I could begin to plead with her, police sirens filled the air and I was immediately filled with relief. Mary quickly got off me and pointed the knife at me saying, No, how did they find out, baby? You didn't call them, did you? One look at the woman in front of me and I could tell she was absolutely crazy. She began pacing the room and was visibly worried, so I decided it was better to play into her game than act out as I already knew how far she was willing to go. I'm so sorry. I didn't know it was you waiting for me, so I called them. Just let me go down there and send them away and I'll be right back. Mary looked at me with what seemed to be relief and I could tell she truly believed what I had just said. She replied, All right, honey, be quick now, and lowered the knife, letting me leave. I bolted downstairs with one thing in mind, get as far away from Mary as I could. As I stepped out of the house, I was met by a group of officers. They asked if anyone else was in the house before storming in and exiting with Mary in the next few minutes. Mary was taken away in tears as she screamed at me for betraying her and not keeping my word, confirming to the police that she was completely crazy. In the last few days, I've been informed by the authorities that Mary is wanted in several states for multiple counts of rape, assault, and suspicion of cannibalism. I was lucky enough to be the only one of her victims to survive her ordeal. That encounter still keeps me up at night, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about the first time I met Mary in McDonald's. I hope my story has helped you all realize that we really know nothing about the people who serve us and our families at McDonald's. In my case, I met a crazy serial killer who posed as a happy-go-lucky woman, but in your case, it just might be the devil who hands you your happy meal with a smile on their face. My name is Charles, and for years, I have been the driver of the last bus. My shift starts at midnight and ends at four in the morning. Working the night shift has its share of loneliness, of course, but I've never experienced anything quite like what happened one autumn night. For the first few hours of my shift, everything went smoothly. A few passengers got on and off. It was around two o'clock in the morning when I arrived at the last stop before turning around and returning to the depot. 
The stop was located in a dark and desolate part of town, right next to an old cemetery. There were a couple of dim streetlights, but most of the streetlights were out. As usual, no passengers were waiting at the stop. As I waited for the scheduled time before departing, I turned on the interior lights of the bus to check that everything was in order. I was checking my rearview mirror when I saw a flash of movement in the darkness. I turned to look out the rearview mirror and to my surprise, saw a man running toward the bus. It was not unusual for people to be late in trying to catch the last bus, but the way this man was moving struck me as odd. His movements were jerky and erratic as if he was panicking. When he finally reached the back of the bus, panting and sweating, I could see his face. He was a middle-aged man with a wild, desperate look in his eyes. I decided to slow the bus down so that this man wouldn't miss it. I was never really one of those drivers who enjoy passengers missing the bus to go home, especially at times like that. The man got on the bus and sat in the back of the bus. His disturbing smile never disappeared from his face. I looked through the rearview mirror and noticed that there were no other passengers on the bus at that time. The bus resumed its march, and as we made our way through the empty streets, the man began to hum a haunting song. It was an ominous tune that I did not recognize, and his voice had an eerie tone that sent chills down my spine. As we moved on, the man continued his strange behavior. He began mumbling incoherent words and laughed disturbingly. I became increasingly uncomfortable and concerned for my safety. The possibility that I was dealing with a dangerous person became increasingly real. Finally, the man stood up and pressed the button indicating that he was getting off. This stop was completely deserted as usual. When I opened the door for the man to get off, he just stood there and kept smiling. I asked him to get off, but he did not respond. Instead, he began to walk slowly toward the front of the bus. I felt trapped in my seat, watching with growing anxiety as the man advanced toward me. His smile widened even more, revealing crooked yellow teeth. I realized I did not know how to deal with this situation, and the thought of confronting him directly terrified me. When the man was only a few steps away from me, he finally spoke. His voice was an eerie, icy whisper that made me shiver. Do you know who I am, driver? I shook my head, unable to answer. I had no idea who this man was or what he wanted. Don't you remember? I was one of your passengers many years ago, one night, just like this. But you wouldn't let me off. You had fun watching me miss the last bus, didn't you? I had no memory of that incident, but that didn't matter at the time. I was too scared to think clearly. The man moved even closer, his face inches from mine. I could feel his cold, stinking breath on my face. This is your last stop, driver. Today, it's your turn to stay behind. Before I could react, the man pushed me back with enormous force. I fell to the ground stunned as he lunged at me. I tried to scream, but his cold, skeletal hand closed over my throat, stifling my words. Looking terrified, I struggled desperately with the man who assaulted me. His eyes, full of fury and madness, were still fixed on mine as his grip grew tighter and tighter. I felt my life slipping away, and an overwhelming panic overcame me. In a last act of survival, I reached for a small flashlight I kept in my jacket pocket. I wielded it with all my strength and hit the man's head with all my might. The impact knocked him back, releasing his hold on my throat. Coughing and gasping, I took the opportunity to pull away from him. As I sat up, I saw the man withering in pain on the ground, holding his head. He looked dazed and confused. Without a second thought, I ran to the driver's door and slammed the safety door of the bus shut, making sure he couldn't reach me. Then frantically, I reached for my cell phone and called 911 for help. The emergency operator's voice calmed my nerves. I explained the situation and the location of the bus. I was promised that the police would be dispatched immediately. As I waited, I held the flashlight in one hand and the bus steering wheel in the other, watching the man on the ground. The man began to come to his senses, but instead of trying to open the front door or looking for a way out, he just sat there and stared at me.
His haunting smile persisted, and it was bigger than ever. He didn't seem to be in pain or show any normal emotion. When the police officers finally arrived, the man was arrested without much resistance. As they handcuffed the man, he continued to whisper incomprehensible words and laugh, which increased my discomfort and fear of him. The officers assured me that an investigation would be conducted and that they would take steps to ensure my safety. After giving my statement to the police, I made my way to the bus stop, shaking and shocked by the experience. I couldn't recall any similar incidents, but the thought of having left someone behind on a night like that haunted me. Eventually, the authorities discovered that the man suffered from severe mental illness and had been wandering the streets for years. He was not one of my former passengers as he had claimed. Although that revelation relieved me to some extent, the experience left me deeply scarred. From that day on, nights working on the bus became even more lonely and terrifying for me. Every shadow in the darkness, every haunting laugh reminded me of that autumn night. The story became an urban legend in the area. My night bus, known as The Last Bus, gained an infamous reputation. Though I tried to move on, that sinister smile and the man's icy whispers never completely disappeared from my thoughts. And my nightlife was changed forever. Hey guys, my name is Adam, and I have a story to tell you. On the outside, I'm sure I look like a normal person. Someone who doesn't have much to say or just goes through much in this life. What no one knows is that I lived a night that would change anyone's life. And the consequences of what I lived are still haunting me. It all started one night in December. I was driving down a lonely road in the middle of the night. I wasn't really going anywhere. I just like to drive at this time. I know many people will disagree and tell me that it's reckless and dangerous, but those comments never bothered me. The drive was going well. It didn't seem to be a very special night, and nothing unusual was happening. But about halfway through, one of the worst possible things that could happen to me. The car started to fail, and soon it came to a complete stop. I had no cell phone signal and was far from anywhere inhabited. I stood outside the car, waiting for someone to come by, but I knew this was very unlikely, so, so I left the car on the road and decided to walk in search of help. I walked for a while and found a house at the end of the road. I approached it in the hope that someone might be able to help me. I knocked on the door, thinking about how I could convince them that I wasn't a psychopath or someone dangerous. But to my surprise, I was greeted by a couple who didn't doubt me for a second. They looked friendly invited me in, offered me food and a place to stay for the night. I admit I started to feel a little uncomfortable, but maybe it was because they were too nice. At that moment, I thought that we were so used to people being cruel or self-serving that when we really see nice people, we get uncomfortable or think something's wrong. As we were eating dinner, I noticed that the food tasted strange, but I didn't say anything for fear of offending my hosts. They were both looking at me with huge grins from ear to ear. They seemed to be obsessed with me eating. After a few more bites, I decided to retire to rest in the room they offered me. In the middle of the night, I heard strange noises outside my room. I carefully got up and tried to get out to see what was going on, but I couldn't. The door to the room was locked. I tried not to panic, not to scream, and tried not to break the door down. But while I was thinking about what to do, I began to hear voices from the other side of the... It seems our little guest didn't enjoy his dinner. I know. I'm sure it lacked enough spices. He made me feel very bad. He's ungrateful. But keep in mind he's not in his own house. It makes sense that he's a little... uncomfortable. I know, darling. Thank you. At that moment, I relaxed a little. Maybe I was overreacting. I considered going back to sleep and the next day to apologize for the way I left the table. But suddenly, I heard something else. Besides, what does it matter if he enjoyed the dinner or not? We're basically just feeding a piglet. It's true, honey. You have to keep him well fed. Tomorrow, I'll make him a big breakfast. That way, when we open him up, he'll taste better. 
Hmm, I can't wait to taste it. It sure is delicious. I just don't understand how human flesh is so good. Hearing those last words, my blood froze and I was paralyzed with terror. In that instant, I understood the true nature of this family. They were cannibals. I was in the house of a family of monsters that fed on human beings. My heart was pounding. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was trapped in the middle of the night, far from any help. I tried to stay calm, but fear paralyzed me. I activated the location on my cell phone and sent it to my brother, telling him I needed help. I quickly told him that I was kidnapped and that if he didn't act quickly, I would be killed. Before I could do anything else, I heard footsteps approaching. I tried to hide, but before I could, the door was opening. It was one of them, with a cold and sinister look. He grabbed me tightly and dragged me into another room. <laughs> you know, I knew you were listening to everything I was saying. Why do you think I said it out loud? Do you think because we live on the road we don't have cameras? Please, don't eat me. Let me out. Oh, come on. You think after all you heard I'd let you go? I tried to resist, but he was stronger. He drug me down the hall and threw me into a room with extreme ease. And as the wife arrived and joined her husband, I saw something that left me in shock. There were dismembered bodies. Human remains. Everywhere. I tried to escape, struggling with all my might, but they were determined to make me their next victim. Grabbing me roughly, the man sat me on a chair and grabbed both my arms so I couldn't run away. Meanwhile, the woman slowly approached me. She had a huge smile on her face, and in her hands, she had a lighted needle puncher, which was slowly moving toward my head. You know, I was terrified, like I'd never been in my life. But a part of me had some hope. One thing I had noticed since I saw the woman with the hole punch was a strange smell coming from them. It was the smell of wine. At that moment I felt the man grabbing me somewhat unsteadily and the woman walking towards me in a very slow and meticulous way. But at the same time, erratic. These people knew what they were doing. They had killed before and had every intention of doing it again. But this time, they made a mistake. They were completely drunk. I decided to try and stay calm and loosen my body a little, looking for an opportunity to attack. When the woman was almost at my side, I managed to kick her in the knee. This caused the man to be distracted for a moment, which I took advantage of to get away from him and hit him. As soon as I regained control of the situation, I ran away, without looking back, with my heart beating so hard that I felt it would leave my body. I ran and ran, not knowing where I was going. I was lost in the darkness of the night. I heard their voices behind me, chasing me. No matter how much alcohol they had, they were still very dangerous indeed, and if they caught me, they would not forgive me for running away. This was all a nightmare, a nightmare that refused to end. Finally, I saw lights in the distance. I ran towards the direction they were coming from, and then I identified the lights better. I realized that I was on the road and that those lights were the police. I came screaming for help, and when they saw me, one of them asked me if my name was Adam. Apparently, these cops were surrounding the area, looking for me. I told the police everything, and they called for reinforcements and went to the cannibal's house. But they didn't find them in the house. They were probably hiding in the woods from the moment they saw the police sirens. On the other hand, everything I told you proved to be true, since they found the corpses of the previous victims and managed to identify the brutal killers. To be honest, I don't know how the case ended. After giving my testimony, I... To be honest, I don't know how the case ended. After giving my testimony, I decided to stay away from the trial altogether. I know for sure they both received life sentences, but... I really didn't want to know anything else about what happened. I didn't want to remember at all what I experienced that night.
That was the last night ride I ever took. It may have been a few years ago, but I still dream of that horrible room. When I wake up, I see the eyes of both psychopaths meeting mine. It's as if they never left me, as if they live inside me, refusing to let me go on with my life and mocking me because I ate human flesh that night. Violent crime is rare in Japan, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I'm Will, and I certainly didn't see myself and my best friend being victims of something so rare while traveling. James and I decided to travel for summer break after our second year of college. We had worked hard in school and our jobs and rewarded ourselves with a trip to Japan to enjoy all the things it had to offer, especially anime. I can't wait to see all things anime. James, my best friend, beamed excitedly as we boarded the airplane. I laughed. I can't wait to eat authentic ramen and steam buns. I licked my lips. I want every noodle dish I can get my hands on, James drooled. We spent the flight talking about all the things we had planned and everything we wanted to eat that we'd seen in anime shows. There was an event that was taking place on Halloween night where you get dressed up as your favorite anime character and interact with other fans. Voice actors were going to be there as well to do meet and greets. James and I could hardly stand how excited we were for the event. Our first week in Japan was spent getting drunk off hot sake and a majority of the traditional dishes. Our plan was to spend an entire month there so we could celebrate Halloween there, but be home for Thanksgiving. So far, we were having the time of our lives. Finally, Halloween came, and we were going to the event we had been looking forward to the most. I was dressed up as Ren Okamura from the hit anime Blue Exorcist, and James went as Naruto. No explanation needed. We got to the train station and boarded the train for downtown Tokyo. The train was crowded, but it was quiet. One thing we found interesting about Japan is that they are a very polite culture and keep to themselves on the train. James and I are very social, but we respected the people that kept to themselves and chatted with others who were social. That night, nearly everyone on the train was wearing a costume. We assumed they too were headed to parties and the same event we were going to. There were a couple of girls dressed as Sailor Moon and Sailor Mars. They smiled at us. We took the opportunity to go talk to them. Good evening, ladies, I said. James winked at them. Sailor Moon flashed a flirtatious smile at me. Nice costumes. Are you going to meet and greet tonight too? Hell yeah, I smirked. <laughs> I love Naruto, Sailor Mars said as she batted her lashes at James who had a dorky smile on his face. I'm Will and this is James, I told them. What are your names? I'm Yuki, Sailor Moon smiled, and this is Renko. We made small talk with the girls for a while. It was about 8 p.m. when we stopped at a train station near Kokurio. A man entered the train dressed as the Joker played by famous actor Joaquin Phoenix. He had everything down to the green slicked back hair, green shirt, orange vest, and red blazer and slacks. He had the makeup with a red mouth painted into a wide smile, the blue makeup around his eyes and the pasty white face. <laughs> nice costume, dude, I called out to him. You look awesome, James chimed in. The man glanced at us, nodded, and went to sit down by himself. That's weird, James grimaced. Yeah, it was. Wonder what his deal is. Let's go talk to him, Sailor Moon suggested to Sailor Mars. To our dismay, the girls got up to go talk to him. He didn't seem interested, but the girls persisted. We both shrugged and continued to enjoy the quiet ride. Though the Joker was looking around at everyone, he seemed agitated and we started to get a bad feeling he was up to no good. We thought maybe he was drunk and didn't hold his alcohol well, so we did our best to ignore him. Our stop is soon, I said, looking down at my phone. Thank God, James sighed with relief. Joker man is starting to freak me out. He might be taking his costume too seriously. For reals, it's just a costume. I shook my head. We were minutes away from our stop, and James and I were anxiously waiting for the train to slow down, when suddenly we heard people screaming. Sailor Moon and Sailor Mars were among them. We turned around to see that the Joker had pulled out a knife 
and began stabbing at anyone and everyone around him. The Sailor Moon girls were lying on their backs on the floor, blood pooling around their bodies and out their mouths. Within seconds, a mass panic took over and people were running like chickens with their heads cut off screaming. James and I couldn't move from our seats as there were people on the floor covered in blood and people stumbling over them, trapping us where we were at. The Joker began to come for us and I stood back in shock as he stabbed James in his side. I felt blood drain from my face as I watched my best friend double over in agony, blood squirting out his side. As we sat at the airport, I pulled out my phone and read up on some articles written about the Joker on the train. He was a Japanese man named Kato who had been obsessed with the Joker movie since it came out in 2019. He had been dressing up like him and going out into the public, mimicking him. Other than creeping out people, he hadn't committed any real crimes until that night on the train. In the movie, there's a scene where the Joker stabs a bunch of people on a train and he was determined to do just that. He was even hoping they would give him the death sentence. Cato looked like a ghost in his mug shots. He had long black hair, dark eyes, and his skin was as white as the makeup he wore. For the time being, Cato was being kept in a mental hospital, but James and I refused to go back until he is behind bars for good. I'm pretty sure the beautiful tale of Snow White has been heard all over the world at this point. The story was Disney's first animated feature film, and it was released in 1937. The tale became an instant classic. It's been about 86 years since the classic movie shared the story of Snow White with the masses, and I'm sure a lot of you can easily narrate the story of Snow White by heart. However, the real story of Snow White is disturbingly different from the one you've all come to know. You see, the original tale of Snow White that inspired the classic movie was based on centuries of real folklore that was cataloged by two famous folklorists called the Brothers Grimm. The original tale was cataloged in Grimm's Fairy Tales in the year 1812, and the details of the ghastly tale were much darker and so much more twisted than what we've all come to know. Disney couldn't release the original tale as it was, so some changes were made to give us the Happy Ever After version that we all know today. But if you'd like to know the truth, I'd advise you to keep listening, because this is the true story of the princess with skin as white as snow. There was nothing I loved more than watching the beautiful snowflakes fall from the sky from my bedroom window. It was something I did every winter. My mother once told me she came up with my name on a day like this. She said she was sewing at her window, which had a frame made of fine black ebony wood just like I love to do. She looked up at the snow while sewing, and she accidentally pricked her finger with the needle. As the drops of blood fell from her finger and onto the snow, my mother thought the red on the white looked so beautiful. It was then that my mother said to herself, if only I had a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as the wood in this frame. Little did she know that she would get her wish soon, as a little while after that, I was born. My mother told me that I was everything she wished for. As my skin was as white as snow, my lips were as red as blood, and my hair was as black as ebony wood. So she called me her little Snow White. The early days of my childhood were the best days of my life. The palace was truly a happy place back then. I loved my father, but my mother and I were inseparable. We would do everything together, and she'd often tell me stories. But as I grew older, and with the mysterious and untimely demise of my father, I started to grow apart from my mother. It wasn't my choice to do so. 
I still loved my mother very much, but I soon noticed that her eyes, which once looked at me with love and joy, now looked at me with hate and envy. It felt like my very existence both disturbed and disgusted my mother every year that I grew older. I'd done nothing wrong for my own mother to treat me like this, and I was given no explanation as to why she looked at me with such hate and jealousy. I'd recently turned seven, and my mother didn't even talk to me on my birthday. To be honest, it seemed like she hated me even more for adding another year. In addition to her strange behavior towards me, there's been a lot of rumors going around the palace, as everyone calls my mother a witch. I didn't believe them at first, but one night, while passing her room, I'd seen her slit the throat of a little black cat and pour its blood on her naked body. A little while after that, I'd seen her carving figurines from what looked like human bones. These weren't the only strange things I'd witnessed, as I also heard her on numerous occasions talking with a strange-looking mirror in her room. I'd never gotten close to the mirror, but every time I looked at it, it felt like the mirror was alive. I could feel this menacing aura around it, and it always gave me chills up my spine. There's also a very disturbing rumor that I don't want to believe, as a lot of people say that it was my mother who killed my father with witchcraft. A makeshift doll with pins sticking out of it was uncovered in the palace, and my father's corpse was found disfigured in a similar manner as the doll. His eyes were nowhere to be found. They told the people that it was a horrible disease that killed him, but many people believed my mother the queen, committed the heinous act to gain control of the kingdom. They also believe this is why she hasn't remarried, as my mother was a very beautiful woman, so she wouldn't have a problem finding a suitor. Even with all these rumors and everything I had seen, I still had hope that my mother possessed a little bit of love for me somewhere in her heart, but I soon realized how wrong I was. As that very night, my mother ordered me to be murdered at the hands of a huntsman. I was awoken roughly in the dead of night, and I was pulled out of bed by a man I didn't know. I was then violently dragged out of the castle and into the woods. The man's firm grip hurt my wrist, and my knees scraped on the floor as I was dragged. I screamed and welled, but he didn't stop. When we were deep in the forest, I was thrown on the floor, and I watched the man pull out a jagged dagger. The fear of death made me scream even louder as I watched him place the dagger over my heart. I didn't want to die as I hadn't lived my life yet, so I begged and sobbed for him to spare my life. I could feel the tip of the dagger pierce my skin now, so I continued to vehemently plead for my life. A part of me thought my life was over and that I would be slaughtered like an animal in the forest, but that's when I saw the hesitation in his eyes. The man who was just trying to kill me a second ago slowly took off his dagger, and he let me go. I thought he was showing me mercy at first, but I was wrong. The man didn't say anything, but I could tell from his eyes that even if he didn't kill me now, he knew it wouldn't take long before a couple of wild animals would tear me apart. And I was just a dead girl walking. I wasn't going to accept that gruesome fate lying down, so I ran as fast as my legs could carry me. I was frightened, but I knew that whatever I was running toward was much better than my murderous mother and her brutal huntsman. I'd almost stained my hands with the blood of a seven-year-old child. While I didn't pierce her heart with my dagger, I know I've already killed her. There are wolves, bears, and mountain lions traversing this forest. It's only a matter of time before one of them kills her and feasts on her remains. What a waste. I do hope her demise is painless, as the child is too pretty to suffer. I let her go because I couldn't bring myself to kill such a beautiful child, so I left it to the animals. I know it was cowardly, but it was as if a stone had fallen from my heart, and I felt nothing but relief. As I watched the running child disappear from my view, I wondered what I was going to do about her mother's morbid request. 
The order she'd given to kill the child was already gruesome enough. But what I dreaded even more was what she told me to do next. Her instructions were clear. After I was summoned, the queen said, Take Snow White out into the woods. I never want to lay eyes on her again, so you must kill her there. When the child is dead, I want you to cut open her corpse and bring back her lungs and liver. I had heard rumors about the queen being a cruel witch, and after meeting with her tonight, I'm starting to believe all the so-called rumors were true. I wondered what the queen was going to do with the child's lungs and liver if I had cut them out of her. I also knew I couldn't go back empty-handed, and as fate would have it, a wild boar crossed my path. I hunted the boar down, and after killing the animal, I took out its lungs and liver. As I carried the bloody organs back to the palace, I prayed the queen wouldn't realize my deception. She was a smart woman and a skilled witch, so I knew it wasn't going to be easy. When I'd finally arrived at the palace, I presented the organs to the queen. She looked at them with joy as she smiled and said, Well done, Huntsman. I then breathed a sigh of relief as I asked her, Your Highness, I assume you asked for these organs to prove I did the deed, and now that I've shown you the hard proof, I hope I've proven my loyalty. I shall get rid of these organs now, for they are foul. The queen looked at me and said, You would do no such thing, Huntsman. Don't even dare to throw organs away. I want you to hand the lungs and liver to the castle cook. I could see the cook waiting in the corner of the room, so I walked over there and handed him the bloody entrails. The cook took the organs and put them in a pot. He then added salt and proceeded to boil them. After they were boiled, he put them on a plate and served them to the queen. I then watched in horror as the queen devoured these organs with a smile on her face. The cannibalistic act made me sick to my stomach, as I knew the queen had no idea it was a boar's lungs and liver she was consuming. She fully believed she was eating the organs of her own daughter, and she was doing it with a sick smile on her face. I held down vomit as I watched her clear the plate. It horrified me to think that the queen's plan, all along, was to kill and consume the liver and lungs of her own child. As a huntsman, I had seen many beasts in my life, but I had never known a beast as vicious and as evil as the queen sitting before me. I didn't know how long I'd been running, but I didn't stop. I felt sharp stones pierce my feet. I felt thorns tear at my skin. I saw and heard the wild animals jump at me, but I kept running till my legs couldn't move anymore. I knew I couldn't keep running forever, and I prayed to come across something, anything that could help me. And that's when I saw it. Right there, in the middle of the woods, was a little house. I thought I was hallucinating at first, but it was really there, so with no other option, I ran inside. The items I found in the house were a bit odd as all the dishes and cutlery seemed to have shrunken down. I also noticed some vegetables and bread on these little plates, and I quickly put them in my mouth as I was extremely hungry. When I was done eating, I saw that there were seven beds in the house. I tried to lie in these beds, but I didn't fit in any of the first six. However, the seventh bed was perfect, so I found myself dozing off. I found myself dozing off because I had no strength left in my body and it wasn't long before I slept off. I awoke a little while later to see seven little men surrounding me. I was frightened, but I could tell from their kind eyes that they weren't bad people. They asked me what happened, and I told them how my mother tried to kill me and how I ran until I came across their house. The dwarfs then said, If you will keep house for us and cook, make beds, wash, sew, and knit, and keep everything clean and orderly, then you can stay with us, and you shall have everything that you want. I was very grateful that they weren't kicking me out, so I said, yes, I'll do everything with all my heart. That's how it was from then on. Every morning, the seven dwarves went into their mountains, looking for ore and gold, and I kept their house for them. Before they left, the dwarves often warned me, saying, Be careful of your mother. She is a powerful witch, and she will soon know that you are here. 
do not let anyone in the house. I always heeded their instructions, so we all got along well, and for the first time in a long while, I was happy. The days quickly passed by. Most of them were uneventful, until one day when a peddler came by, selling beautiful wares, clothes, and bodice laces. My clothes were already worn at this point, so I decided to buy a bodice lace. I knew the dwarves told me not to let anyone in, but she seemed like an honest woman, so I let her in. I bought one of her bodice laces, and she offered to tie the strings for me, but as she touched the strings of the garment, I felt them tighten themselves. Like dark magic, the laces choked and strangled me, and the peddler now had a sick grin on her face. I realized it was my mother in disguise, and she left me there to be strangled to death. I stayed there, gasping for air, and I was about to pass out when the drawers came home and saved my life. The horrific experience made me a lot wearier than I was, so I made sure to never let anyone in the house again. A couple of weeks passed after that before we had another visitor. It was an old woman this time. She said she was selling some goods, and she urged me to open the door and let her in. I didn't agree, and I told her to leave, but she brought out a comb and said, Come, child, let me just comb your hair, and you'll see how nice it feels. I didn't want to let her in, but I felt bad for the old woman. She had already come all this way, and even if I wasn't going to buy anything, I went out of the house to let her comb my hair, but once the comb touched my scalp, my whole body was paralyzed and I was unable to move. I was left there in the cold to die, but luckily, the dwarves came home soon. They realized I was poisoned by the comb that was still in my hair, so they removed it and washed the poison out of my hair. I had been fooled again, and it almost cost me my life. My mother had tried to kill me two times now, and I wonder why she didn't want to leave me alone. I swore to myself that there wouldn't be a third time, but it wasn't long before we had another visitor. A peasant woman made her way to our house in the morning. She was carrying a basket with what seemed to be red apples. Before she reached our door, I stuck my head out of the window and said, I am not allowed to let anyone in. The drawers of this house have forbidden me to do so. Please leave. The peasant woman then responded with, That is all right with me. I'll just easily get rid of my apples. Here, you can have one of them for free. The woman then brought out a red apple from her basket, so I said, No, I cannot and I will not accept anything. I thought the peasant woman would understand that I didn't want anything from her and leave, but she stood her ground and said, Are you afraid of poison, child? Look, I'll cut the apple in two. You eat the red half and I shall eat the white half. The woman then split the apple before putting the white part in her mouth. I still didn't want anything from her, but before I could tell her to leave again, I felt a strange feeling come over me. It felt like I was being enchanted by the red apple, as my hands started to move by themselves. I tried to fight it, but it was no use, and before I knew what was happening, I had already taken a bite out of the red apple. The world around me started to darken and I watched the peasant woman transform into my mother. As I struggled to breathe, she looked down at me and said, I curse the day you crawled out of my womb, you insolent child. She then laughed before continuing with, White as snow, red as blood, black as ebony wood. This time the dwarves cannot awaken you. The darkness had almost surrounded me now, as I couldn't see much anymore. I felt tears run down my cheek as I knew I was dying. I tried to call out to the dwarves, but my lips couldn't move, and it wasn't long before everything finally went black, and the only thing I could see was darkness. We came home to find the child that we've loved so much lying dead on the floor. We tried everything to revive her, but we couldn't. All seven of us sat next to her, and we cried and mourned for three days. We were going to bury her, but even in death, she was still beautiful, as her skin did not decay. We told ourselves, we cannot bury this beautiful child in the black earth. 
We then made a transparent glass coffin so that she could be seen from all sides. We wrote our name on it with golden letters and we placed the coffin on the mountain. Each of us promised to always watch after her as we loved her like she was one of us. It was my fifth trip to this forest. My father had always told me that as the prince, I should make myself familiar with the land. I had gone through this forest many times, but this time was different as I had come across a little house filled with seven dwarves, and these dwarves possessed a priceless treasure. This treasure was a transparent glass coffin, and a beautiful girl was lying in it. Her beauty was otherworldly as I had never seen anything like it. I begged the dwarves for it, telling them that I would give them anything, but they said they wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. I wasn't going to give up, as I felt like I would die if I couldn't lay my eyes upon her every day. So I said, Then give it to me, for I cannot live without being able to see Snow White. I will honor her and respect her as my most cherished one. The dwarves saw my love for Snow White. It took a while, as they didn't want to give her up easily, but they eventually agreed. The very next morning, I ordered my servants to pick up the coffin and take it back with me to the castle. One particular servant was unhappy with this, as he said, My lord, my back aches terribly, and I see no need for us to carry this corpse of a child to the castle, no matter how beautiful it is. I then responded with, You would do as you were told. She is mine, and I will cherish her forever. So pick up the coffin and follow me. Angered, my servant opened the coffin and struck Snow White with his fist. I immediately reached for my sword to kill him, but before I could take off his hand, I noticed the blow had caused Snow White to spit out something that was stuck in her throat. And to my surprise, I saw her beautiful eyes open. She lifted the lid of the coffin, and it was love at first sight. She was also a bit confused, so I told her everything that had happened. I then asked her if she would like to come to my father's castle and be my wife. We hadn't spoken much, but the connection and love between us were strong. So she agreed, and it wasn't long before we planned our wedding. The day of our wedding was the happiest day of my life. I laughed, ate, and danced with my bride, and I couldn't think of anything that could be better than this. As the celebrations continued, I noticed someone who wasn't supposed to be there. It was Snow White's mother, the evil queen. My bride had told me everything that she had done to her, and I felt my heart fill with anger. I could tell she was shocked to see her daughter alive, as she stood there frozen with a baffled look on her face. Since she was distracted, I ordered my men to seize her. I had a feeling she would show up, so I prepared one of the most brutal punishments for the wicked like her. I ordered a pair of iron shoes to be put in burning coals and heated till they shone bright red. These shoes were quickly brought forth with tongs and placed before her feet. I then forced her to step into the heated iron shoes. Her screams filled the entire kingdom as I made her dance in agony and I wasn't going to stop until she died. The smell of burning flesh filled the air as I laughed and watched my mother dance in the red-hot iron shoes. She screamed and called out to me, but I clapped and left her to keep suffering. Yes, she was my mother, but she deserved everything that was happening to her. I could tell the heated iron shoes had burned off all the flesh in her feet as the heat had started eating into her skin and bones. She was frothing at the mouth, and her eyes were bulging red as she danced around, wailing. The heat from the iron shoes had completely burned both her feet now, and it wasn't long before my mother dropped dead at my feet. I felt nothing as I watched them remove her feetless corpse from the premises. I had come to realize that we both couldn't exist in this world, and my mother had to die for me to have my happily ever after. So there you have it, the gruesome but true story of Snow White. As you now know from hearing the story in its original version, there was no wicked stepmother, as the woman who did all these heinous things was Snow White's very own mother. A lot of things had to be taken out and changed from the original version, like the act of witchcraft, the morbid cannibalistic acts, the repeated murder attempts, Snow White's young age, 
and her mother's gruesome end. This was all too dark, so we were given an easier ending that told us everything was fixed with true love's kiss. But that was all a lie, as Snow White had to kill her mother to get her happy ending. So now that you know the truth, my question to everyone listening to this is, what are you willing to do to get your own happy ever after? Hi, I'm Kevin Malone, and I work in a grocery store. Most of the time, there are hardly any customers, so I either take up my distance learning courses on my PC at the grocery store, or I watch YouTube videos. But recently, a friend of mine introduced me to the dark web. Some people call it the deep web. Now, mind you, I'm just a high school graduate. I'm no computer whiz, but I really love exploring new things. So when I installed the Tor browser and started exploring the deep web, I was pretty excited at first. There were many websites that I encountered. Some were pretty standard ones, like the ones you find on any other web browser, and some were pretty messed up. There was one with the last words of all the death row inmates. I read some of that and couldn't get it out of my head for days. I found some meth and other drug dealers that sell drugs online on the dark web. I found some arms dealers, too. But I never invested much time on such sites as I knew it could be dangerous. Also, I didn't do drugs or wasn't interested in buying a firearm. But I loved to explore the deep web and all the creepy things going on there. Nevertheless, my job was pretty uninteresting. I did the inventory for the grocery store and sat in the back office. Many people from our town visited the grocery store, many of my friends and family members included. For the last few months, there were some weird things happening in our town. Girls were going missing. Young girls from the ages of 16 to 25 were going missing from our town and the neighboring town as well. There was a sense of fear in the area. No one knew who was doing it and why. Moreover, no bodies were ever found, so the cops couldn't do much in terms of investigation. Everyone was told to be alert, and especially women and girls were suggested to leave the house only when necessary and to be in the company of someone. No girls left the house after dark alone. I too had a young sister, so I was worried as well, and most of the time I accompanied her everywhere. Every day before coming to work, I would drop her at school and make sure my mom and father picked her up when she got out. Anyway, last evening while browsing on the tour browser, I found an Onion website. It was a penciler website, and so far I haven't seen anything like that. This site was weird, as it was a murder-on-demand site. What the hell does murder-on-demand even mean? So... I decided to check out the site. The overall design of the site was creepy. It only had three pages with a home page that had a contact form at the end of it. It also had an about page. This page was about the killer. It didn't have any personal information, but it said that this was the killer's part-time job and that he was an artist by profession. This had already creeped me out so much that I was about to close the browser and go home. But then, something at the back of my mind made me check out the last page, which was a portfolio page. This page was truly horrific. It had images of mutilated dead bodies, mostly women, and their faces were always blurred. And in none of the photos had the killer shown him or herself. I was so repulsed by some of the photos that I puked in the bin below my desk. After that, I called it a night and drove home. That night, I couldn't sleep or even eat my dinner. I just laid awake in my bed, thinking about the horrors those ladies had to face at the hands of this serial killer. And who even demanded for these girls to be killed so brutally? I somehow managed to get some shut-eye. But the next morning, as soon as I got to work, I couldn't stop myself from revisiting the website. That's when my boss knocked on the door of my small cabin. He asked me to mind the cash counters for an hour or so, as we were understaffed and had a lot of customers. I didn't mind at all, as I had no inventory to update at the moment. As soon as I got out there looking at the crowd, I knew that I would be out there for a long time. 
As I checked out customers one after the other, I was dying to get back to the site and check it out even more. Just then, a customer brought me back for my thoughts. He placed a bunch of art supplies and some hardware supplies on the counter. I looked up at him, and I recognized him to be one of my seniors from school. I guess he was about three years older than me, and now he was a famous painter in our small town. He sold his paintings at a pretty high rate, and some of his work was in art galleries across the world. I greeted him and asked him if he was working on anything new. He was a nice guy and said that he was planning on starting a new project soon, but currently he was focusing on a part-time venture of his. I asked him some more questions about his work and he ended up showing me some pictures of the paintings he had done. They were truly phenomenal. Finally, I checked him out, put his stuff in a bag, and waved him goodbye. After almost four hours, I returned to my office and started checking the site while I ate my lunch. I scrolled through all the pictures I'd seen last night and started seeing some more pictures of dead women and their various body parts. Soon, something caught my eye in the background of the picture. It was of a decapitated woman, and in the background in one corner was a very familiar looking painting. I zoomed in and, sure enough, I knew where I had seen the painting before. So just to make sure I saw all the pictures on the website, and in the background of many of them, I could see some very familiar paintings that I had seen merely hours ago. I knew I had solved the most complicated case our town had ever experienced. But I knew that I was dealing with a serial killer here, so I had to be very careful how I proceeded from here on. First of all, I screenshotted all the photos, then copied them to a pen drive and packed the pen drive in an envelope. Next, I wrote a short note that said, Check the painter's basement, and put it inside the envelope too. That evening while driving home, I dropped the envelope in the box office of the police station. The next morning before I woke up, my parents and my sister were busy watching the news. The cops had raided the artist's house and found three girls chained, abused, and starved in his basement. And more dead bodies were found buried on his property. He was arrested, and I believe that he will get the punishment he deserves. Luckily, those three girls were rescued. The cops found his website on the dark web and shut it down immediately. And no one knows who tipped off the cops. We all probably hear the phrase, I don't eat meat, more than 20 times a week. We hear it when entering a restaurant, we hear it when ordering food, and we also hear it in our daily conversations. And while I thought I'd never utter those words, an incident that happened a few years ago made me swear to never eat meat again. This gruesome story details my horrific experience and explains why I don't eat meat. I had just come home from college, it was the summer break, and coming home was always great because I got to see my childhood friends. Tommy was like my best friend, as we'd known each other since childhood. He was a bit shy and reserved while I was outgoing and social, but even with our different personalities, we were like brothers. Every summer there was an organized get-together where all our childhood friends would meet up and catch up with each other. Tommy didn't like going to these things, but I always forced him to. When we got there, we mingled, ate, and caught up with most of our other childhood friends. Towards the end of the program, a man walked up to us, and I recognized him. It was Alexander Anderson. He was an eccentric foodie who was obsessed with finding new tastes. He was also a hugely popular YouTuber. His channel featured various food-related topics like ASMR, mukbangs, and new cuisines, basically everything that had to do with food. While he was one of our childhood friends, we weren't really close to him, as Alexander was a little weird as a kid. Jake! Tommy! It's so good to see you! Alexander said as he pulled us in for a hug. You both smell so good! Now, this was a weird statement, as Tommy and I weren't wearing any cologne, but I brushed it off as I thought it was just one of his pleasantries. So I said, It's nice to see you, Alexander. He then asked, did you enjoy the food? Tommy responded with, It was great. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, seeing as I made the whole thing, he said. Well, you did a good job. I also thought it was lovely. I replied. He smiled and said, Now, 
I'm about to film a new mukbang video for my YouTube channel, and I would love it if you two would participate in it. Now, I wasn't really much of a food enthusiast, and neither was Tom, but I didn't want to be rude, so I gladly agreed and told him we'd be in his YouTube video. Alexander then said, Great, I'll send you my address details and we'll see you on Wednesday. Before walking away, Tommy wasn't too happy about this. You shouldn't have done that, Jake. You know I don't like going to things like that. Don't worry, I replied. I'm sure it'll be a fun experience. Little did I know that it'd be an experience I would never forget. It was finally Wednesday and we were driving to Alexander's house. Tommy was feeling really anxious and he said to me, I don't know about this, Jake. I'm having a really odd feeling about this. We both know how weird Alexander is. I assumed it was just Tommy's introvert nature acting up, so I calmed him down, saying, Come on, dude. I knew he was a bit weird when he was a kid, but he's a man now. Tommy replied, I know he is, but he's still weird. Didn't you notice how he looked at us at the get-together? He had this creepy smile on. Plus, he said we smelt good. Both of us know we weren't wearing any cologne. Something just seems off about this. I figured all this was probably just Tommy being in his head, so I said, I really didn't notice any of that, but it's probably all in your head, man. We'll be fine. We eventually arrived at Alexander's house, and the first thing I noticed was how huge it was. I knew being a YouTuber paid well, but I didn't realize it paid this well. We knocked on the door and Alex quickly rushed to open it. He looked ecstatic and the look he gave us was more craving than happy. He eventually spoke. Come in, come in, he said. We walked in and stood in the hallway. You gentlemen smell divine, he said. This time I was wearing cologne, which made it less odd, but there was something eerie about the way he said it. Thank you, I replied. Tommy clearly wasn't comfortable hearing Alex say that again, but he smiled and nodded. Wait here while I get the cameras ready, Alex said before walking away. We sat down on the seats in the hallway, and the more I sat there, the more I began to feel as anxious as Tommy. I would remind myself that I'm an adult at intervals, and I needed to stop being immature. The silence in the mansion was eerie and creepy. What the fuck is that? Tommy said, breaking the silence. I turned to see him looking at a painting on the wall. The painting seemed to consist of various human figures, eating a small child. Are they eating her? Tommy said, visibly disturbed. I knew at first glance that was exactly what was happening, but decided not to freak Tommy out, so I said, It looks like it, but I'm not sure. It's such a bizarre painting. That's when we heard Alexander's voice from the end of the hall. Beautiful, isn't it? I found it in an art gallery. The painter said it was inspired by an old tribe who always felt incomplete. So, in order to find completion, they took from another. Tommy responded with, What does that even mean? Alexander smiled and said, Only people of true art can understand it. Well, I think it's a fucking weird painting and you should get your money back. I could see Tommy was annoyed now, and I decided I should probably step in, but before I could say anything, Alexander continued with, Well, it cost me $20,000, and I don't regret spending that amount because it was well worth it. You may not see the beauty now, my dear Tommy, but with time, you will. Tommy was about to say something, but Alexander quickly cut him off. The cameras are ready, and I'd like us to begin shooting the video. Tommy wasn't happy, but he said, Fine, let's get it over with. As we walked down to the kitchen, I could tell Tommy was mad at me, as I was the one who dragged him into this, and it showed. I too was feeling extremely anxious, but Alex seemed completely oblivious to all this, as he still had a huge smile on his face. I knew Alex was always a weird dude, but this was getting a bit too much, and just as I thought things couldn't get any worse, he showed us what we would be eating. At first glance, you'd know it was meat, but the question was, what kind? It didn't look like pork, beef, or chicken, and it didn't smell like any of them either. I looked at Tommy and knew he was thinking the exact same thing, 
But before Tommy said anything, I asked Alexander, What kind of meat is this? Because it doesn't look like anything I've had. Is it mutton? He looked at us and said, Well, if I told you, it would defeat the point of the mukbang video. You don't have to know what it is. Just know it's delicious. He then told us to sit down because he was about to start the video, but my mind had already started flying to numerous places. I wasn't even paying attention to what Alexander was saying in the introduction as I began to ask myself if Tommy was right all along. Have I been too nice? I was about to say something when Alex finally said to the camera, Now, my childhood friends and I are going to try out this mystery meat. He handed us a portion and despite my lack of enthusiasm to eat whatever it was, I decided to get it over with and leave. As Alex started eating, Tommy and I put the mystery meat in our mouths and as soon as it touched my tongue, it was as if all my worries went away. There are no words to describe how delicious this mystery meat tasted. I instinctively went for another and so did Tommy. Alex began to laugh as he said to the camera, <laughs> Looks like they like it. I ate to my fill that day, and just like that, all the anxiousness, creepiness, and weirdness went away. After the video was finished, we all hung out and had a great afternoon. Turns out, there was more to Alex than just food. He was also into gaming, music, and movies. And we talked and bonded for the rest of the afternoon. I had just heaved a sigh of relief, as I had become comfortable, and Tommy had too. And I thought to myself, I'm so glad we came. As we sat there talking, Tommy eventually said, But really, man, that mystery meat was delicious. What is it, really? Alex said the meat was imported, but he was sure it was just a combination of assorted meat as he tasted a hint of chicken. As he continued talking, I felt the need to pee, so I asked Alex for his bathroom, and he said it was down the hall to the left. After using the bathroom, I started to go back to the living room, but I felt really thirsty as I had eaten a lot of meat, so... I went to the kitchen, opened the fridge, and took out some water to drink. As I was drinking the water, I began to notice something out the corner of my eye. Was that a... I screamed before I could finish the thought. Right there in Alex's fridge was what seemed to be the hand of a human child. And the more I looked, the worse it got. Behind the groceries were more human parts. Feet, arms, fingers... And right then and there, my brain put everything together. I threw up immediately, and I began to scream again. That's when I heard Tommy call out to me. Jake, are you oak? I didn't hear him finish the sentence. All I heard was a thumping sound like something fell, followed by silence. It didn't take long before Alex was standing in the kitchen, holding a metal pipe. The end of the pipe had something red on it that I figured was blood. He stood, looking at me in silence with a smile on his face for about two minutes before saying, I see you found your favorite dish. I wanted to say something, but ended up throwing up again. And before I could raise my head, I felt the hard metal pipe hit it, and I blacked out. I began to slowly open my eyes, and the first thing I saw were bright, flashing lights. It took a while before my vision focused, and I could finally see my surroundings. I was in what seemed to be a basement. I was also tied down to what seemed to be a hard concrete rock. The rock had red liquid stains all over it, and it reminded me of a butcher's slab. To my right I saw Tommy. He was unconscious, and he too was also tied down to something similar. I could hear Alex's voice saying, What's up, my fellow eccentric foodies? Now that you've all watched the preliminary video, this is where the real fun starts, and I do this only for you, my premium fans. I could finally see him, and he was standing in front of a camera. He was wearing an apron and lights were staged all around us. I was feeling a bit woozy after the blow to my head, but I blurted out the first thing that came to my mind. Alex, you sick freak! He then slowly turned to look at me and had this sick smile on his face. Look, guys, our meal is awake, he said while staring at the camera. What do you want from us? I screamed. He slowly looked at me and said, What do we want? 
We want what it is you've failed to appreciate all these years. The divine food that has been you all this while. He walked up to me and buried his nose in my chest. You smell so good. So tasty. Your sweat is doing a really good job of seasoning you up. As he said those words again, the realization hit me. So that's what you meant by that? I asked. He didn't respond. He just walked to the camera and said, That's enough chatter with the food. He walked over to get what looked like a toolkit from a shelf and started bringing out all sorts of sharp butcher knives. He then looked at the camera and spoke as if he was on a cooking show talking to an audience. Now, when the meat is fresh like this, there are some parts that are only delicious when eaten raw. He then walked up to Tommy with the knife in his hand. He lifted Tommy's head and held on to Tommy's ear. And with a clean cut, he took Tommy's ear off. My stomach churned and I felt like throwing up again. I'm guessing the pain woke Tommy up because he immediately started screaming. And Alex, with no hesitation, put Tommy's bloody ear into his mouth like it was a cracker. I looked at him with disgust as I began to shout, You sick freak! Don't you dare touch my friend! He looked at me and said, Don't look at me like that. We both know that you love the taste. I saw your eyes as you gobbled down that meat. You had tasted something divine, and after that, you never go back. Don't you see, Jake? We are all walking cuisines. Children, teens, adults, each of us has our different flavor. And I have to taste them all. Tommy was screaming and began to cry. I looked at Alex as he continued ranting all of his nonsense, but all that was going through my mind was, I have to get out of here, and I have to take Tommy with me. Because a part of me knew this was all my fault. If only I had listened to Tommy, he wouldn't be in this mess. I began to profusely pull at my constraints. My wrists and ankles hurt, but I didn't care. As I did this, I watched him walk over to Tommy's feet. And while looking at the camera, he said, Another wonderful part to eat raw is the toes. Mmm, the taste is wonderful. And with no hesitation, I watched him bite off two of my friend's toes. He looked like an animal. Blood was all over his face as he said to the camera, Now, when eating the toes raw, you suck and nibble. You don't bite so as to avoid biting down on the bone. Tommy was screaming uncontrollably now and I could only imagine the pain he was going through. I kept pulling on my constraints till my hands and feet felt like they were about to pop. What Alex did next is something that I still see every time I close my eyes. He walked up to Tommy and said, Now, you don't want your food to be struggling when cutting off the good parts, so it's best for them to bleed out. A clean, thin cut across the neck should do. Now, not too deep. He paused and continued with, We've got some good stuff in there. He looked at me, and with that, he carefully slit Tommy's throat open. Blood gurgled out Tommy's neck and down his chest. Oh, he's so messy, Alex said, cleaning the knife on his apron and walking away. As I watched Tommy bleed out, I began to scream. Tom, Tommy, hold on, man. I'm going to get you out of here. Alex, who was completely unfazed by everything that was going on, just kept on talking to the camera. Now, we have to get the preserving oil as we need to keep the meat in pristine condition. I'll be right back. He walked up the stairs and with that, he was gone. As I watched Tommy bleed out and slowly stop moving, I began to cry. Don't worry, man. I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to fix this. I said in tears. Then, Tommy began to speak. It was obvious it was hard for him to do, but he did anyway. It's all right, Jake, he said to me in a really low voice. None of this is your fault. Now you make sure to get out of here. You're my brother, man, and I loved you. Silence followed and he stopped moving. I could see his blood all over his body, and I began to call out his name. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew he was dead. As I cried, I began pulling harder at my constraints till I felt my wrist snap. 
The pain was unimaginable, but I was free. As I walked up to Tommy's body and began to sob, I saw the metal pipe on the floor and picked it up. I began to hear footsteps, so I waited at the base of the steps. I'm back, guys, I heard him say. Hopefully the meat has bled out. And without hesitation, I struck him hard on his face, and he fell to the floor. I noticed he was still breathing, and even though he was unconscious, I wanted to kill him so badly. But I didn't. I told myself he already ruined my life by killing my best friend, and killing him would just ruin my life even more. So instead of beating him to death, I went upstairs to call the cops. After that, I came back down to the basement. I walked up to Tommy's body, and I cried my heart out. The weeks that followed seemed like a fast blur. I was called by the cops for questioning, and I told them everything I knew. They told me I was lucky to be alive because no one out of the 30 victims they found had ever escaped Alex. They also told me that he was running a secret streaming channel for his premium subscribers on the deep web, which explains why he was filming us, and over a thousand users were found. I was alarmed at this because it just meant there are a thousand people out there who are as sick as Alex. The families of the victims were informed, and they all demanded justice. But Alexander pled insanity, so he was taken to a high-profile state mental hospital. Tommy's parents were pained by this, and I heard the other victims' family were appealing the case so that he could get a life sentence, or even the death penalty. I hoped it worked out for them, because that man truly deserved to die by the hands of justice. We buried Tommy during that week and I said my final goodbyes to my best friend. It's been five years since this incident, and instead of letting it break me down mentally, I pushed on with my life. I'm married now, and I have a two-year-old daughter. I still go to therapy regularly, but it doesn't really help. Because every time I close my eyes, I find myself back there. And while I don't eat meat, sometimes I get this irresistible urge to do so. Sometimes I find myself looking at my kid daughter. I'd be salivating and wondering how she tastes. Sometimes I'd look at my wife in the same way, too. I regularly get thoughts to cut my own arm off and cook it, just to get that taste. But I use all the strength in my body to overcome these morbid thoughts, because I love my family. No matter how hard it gets, I will move on. Alexander Anderson may have been a sick freak, but he didn't lie when he said, Once you've tasted something divine, you can never go back. I was alone in McDonald's one night, as usual, closing up shop after a long shift. It was a cold, rainy night, and the atmosphere at the restaurant was eerie. My co-workers had already finished their work and left, leaving me alone to take care of the final cleaning and closing tasks. The place was silent, with only the sounds of the rain pattering against the glass and the hum of the fluorescent lights. As I went about my chores, I began to feel a strange sensation, as if someone was watching me. As I was cleaning the tables and picking up the trash, I noticed that one of the chairs was slightly pushed out of its usual place. I went over to adjust it, thinking that someone might have moved it before leaving, but I didn't see anyone in the restaurant. As I finished picking up the trash in the table area, something else strange caught my eye. The cash register was open. I remember closing it after the last customer paid for his order. I cautiously approached it and closed it again, wondering if I had forgotten to do so. The feeling of being watched continued to grow, and now I felt more uncomfortable than ever. As I headed toward the kitchen to finish cleaning the fryer, I heard a noise coming from the bathroom area. I walked over and saw that the men's room door was opening and closing on its own, as if someone was inside. I froze for a moment, not knowing how to react. Could there be someone inside? Would there be anyone else in the restaurant besides me? With slow, fearful steps, I approached the bathroom door and carefully pushed it open. To my surprise, it was empty. There was no one there. 
The feeling that something strange was going on became more intense. I decided to quickly finish the cleaning and close the McDonald's. I headed to the kitchen, and as I was tending to the fryer, I felt an intense cold all around me. I looked toward the window and saw a blurry figure standing next to the soda machine. The figure was fuzzy as if composed of shadows. I couldn't make out facial features, but I could feel its presence. My heart was pounding as I faced this terrifying sight. I decided to remain calm and not let fear overpower me. Surely there was an explanation for this, wasn't there? At that moment, I thought that none of this could be real. That day I was particularly tired. I had slept very little and maybe I was still very suggestible from the horror movies I had seen the day before. I told myself that what had happened with the chairs and the cash register was just coincidence and that surely the bathroom door was just the wind. All of that had been a suggestion and surely now it was just my head playing tricks on me. In denial, but absolutely terrified, I finished cleaning the fryer, but the figure was still there, motionless. The atmosphere was filled with negative and hostile energy. I felt the air was tighter than ever and I began to breathe with more and more difficulty. Confused, I looked back in the direction of the shadow, but something had changed. She was no longer there. At that moment, my heart almost stopped when I realized that the reason the shadow was no longer in that position was because it was next to me. It had no face or features. It was as if a shadow had taken on a corporeal state. It said nothing, but its mere presence communicated to me that I was not welcome. I felt trapped and frightened, not knowing what to do. I backed slowly toward the friar, not taking my eyes off the figure. It was then that the entity began to move, approaching me slowly and intimidating me. Every step I took filled me with terror. I tried to run away, but in a blink of an eye, I was in front of the friar. Before I could react, my body began to move only towards the friar, which was suddenly on, and even though I had pulled it out, it was full of oil. I struggled with all my might to avoid falling into it, but my head was getting closer and closer. By forcing myself, I could stop it temporarily, but still, with each passing second, I was closer to it. I could feel the drops of oil jumping towards my face, and the heat of the oil began to irritate my skin. The pain was unbearable, and I knew that if I gave in, my life would be in danger. I used all the strength I had in me, and with one last effort, managed to free myself from the entity. I fell to the ground, my skin reddened and burned by the heat of the fryer. I crawled from the fryer, feeling an intense pain on my skin. The shadowy entity was still there, watching me. My hands were shaking as I tried to get up, but my body was weakened by the effort and fear. Once outside, I thought the cold rain and wind would make my face stop hurting, but the opposite was true. My face burnt so much, it was as if the oil was still on it, burning me more and more. I walked away from the restaurant and sought refuge in my car, where I felt a little safer. I took a deep breath, trying to calm down as I felt the burning of the burns on my face and hands. At that moment, I had the impression that if whatever the shadow was had wanted to kill me, it would have simply done it. I couldn't help but feel tiny, like I had encountered something far beyond my understanding, and the only reason I survived was by a quirk of fate. I decided not to return to the restaurant that night. Instead, I called the manager to explain what had happened and asked him to check the security cameras. At first, he thought it was a joke. Then he thought I was drunk. As I started the car, I looked into the restaurant through the windshield and saw that the entity was still there, standing at the emergency door, staring at me. A few minutes later, the manager told me that the police had already gone to the area and found no one. He himself was in charge of closing the restaurant with the police nearby, and he didn't see anything either. When he heard me panic, he told me that the next day we should see the recordings and that today I would just rest. The next day, we both went to McDonald's and reviewed the security footage. My manager found out that everything I had told him was true. On the recording, we could see how I was struggling against myself to keep my head out of the oil, while a shadow was standing in front of me. There was no logical explanation for its origin or nature, but the manager confessed to me that other employees had warned him that they had seen a strange figure during the night. 
He naturally never believed the stories and thought it was an inside joke the night shift employees had on him. At that moment, he realized that everything he had been told was true. The figure seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. It simply appeared until in a moment out of nowhere, it disappeared again. The entity had completely disappeared. There was no sign of its presence, no footprints or traces. It was as if it had never been there. As I left the McDonald's, the manager told me to get urgent treatment for what happened to my face. Because even after hours, it was still burning, and the few creams I had used at home had not worked. That was my last day working at McDonald's, and shortly after, I found out that it was closed for a few months. Part of me was relieved, Relieved that something like that wouldn't happen to anyone else. But this didn't last long. A few months later, the restaurant reopened and life went on. A few times, I went with my friends to eat. And sometimes, I would see the same manager walking the aisles of the place. Every time the manager saw me at the tables, he would just look away. Possibly, it was an embarrassment. As both he and I knew that another innocent employee would close the McDonald's on the night shift it was a potential victim of that entity, and he would do nothing to stop it. Hi, my name is Ethan, and I'm 37 years old. During my youth in the 1990s, a horror fad was taking over the world, popularized in movies, television, and even books. These new horror icons were clowns. The craze took over the world, but was replaced years later with something new. However, for me, the fear never left. That chilly night in October left a deeply rooted phobia towards clowns that still lives with me to this day. During the 1990s, my dad and I developed a weekly tradition. It started when I was eight years old and ended that dreaded day in October. Every Saturday morning, he would take me to McDonald's for our father-son weekend breakfast ritual. Without a veil, We'd be sitting in our usual booth at 8 a.m. sharp every Saturday morning. It was like clockwork. But one morning, when I was 10, something was slightly different. That morning I did the usual. I got out of the car and pulled the entrance to the door, causing a sharp ding chime. The familiar aroma of fresh hash browns and syrup greeted me. I ran to our booth to wait while my dad ordered our food. But I noticed something different. In the lobby stood a tall and brightly colored clown. He wore a large yellow suit with exposed striped socks and a long sleeve shirt. His hair and nose were as red as the stripes on his socks. His face was as white as the snow, creating a strong contrast. He wore a comically large red smile and shoes. The clown was busy with other boys and girls that hugged him and posed for pictures. They all laughed together as the disposable cameras flashed in the hands of proud parents. My dad joined me sitting in the booth. Did you see? He gestured towards the lobby. Wanna go take a picture? The clown looked happy. He looked fun. He looked like the clown that had attended my friend Andy's party. I jumped out of my seat and rushed over to him. By then, the clown had sat on a chair. Our eyes met among the laughter of the running children in bustling kitchen. Hello, little boy, he said in a rambunctious, goofy voice. Would you like to take a picture? He waved his yellow-gloved hand. Can I, Dad? I asked anxiously. He nodded. I ran to the clown. He patted his lap twice. Ah, hold on, said my dad. Let me go find the camera. The bell chimed as he exited. I sat on the clown's lap. My name's Ronald, he said joyously. Ronald McDonald. What's your name? I sat in silence, conflicted by my instruction to not talk to strangers and to not be rude to your elders. He didn't insist. He stared forward, grinning his crimson smile. I began to feel tension in the air. Something about his wide eyes and blood-red mouth made me uncomfortable. For 20 seconds, we sat together until his neck began to crane forward, bringing his mouth close to my ear. I'm going to fucking kill you, Ethan, he whispered in my ear. The goofy tone was gone, replaced by a deep and raspy snarl. My ten-year-old brain didn't comprehend what had been said, 
I knew one of those words was a bad word that I wasn't allowed to say. But to kill me? Was this a joke? I hadn't told him my name. How did he know I was Ethan? A familiar ding announced my dad's arrival, and seconds later, a flash illuminated my nervous smile. Okay, bye, I said anxiously. He stared at me and walked away, blank smile and wide-eyed. By that evening, any discomfort about the interaction had washed off me. I ran up my stairs after dinner to play some video games before bed. At 10 p.m., just as I was getting into bed, a click came through my window. I ignored it. A second one came. I approached the window, and just then, the third rock came and hit the glass. I stared down. He was there. On my front lawn, that clown that called himself Ronald stood. He waved his yellow wave with one hand and curled his index finger on his other hand, gesturing me to come down. Do you want to play, Ethan? He snarled. The shock of his voice made me fall back on the ground, but when I got up and looked out, he was gone. The following week I entered my classroom, and my stomach plummeted when I saw him standing next to Mr. Scott in front of the class. They discussed that Ronald was visiting to raise awareness for a certain charity. He smiled and talked in his goofy voice. I found it odd he was alone in attendance, but pushed the thought away. On my way out of class, he stared me down and waved. By Ethan. That weekend, my family went to dinner at McDonald's. Driving into the parking lot, I began to get nervous. I was anxious. But to my relief, Ronald was nowhere to be seen. We sat in our usual booth as the tension began to ease up inside me. Just as our food was being served, I jumped from my seat and headed to the bathroom to wash my hands. I scrubbed, rinsed, and I dried my hands my stomach aching in hunger. When something hit my shoe, I recoiled in fear. It was a roll of toilet paper. It had slid from under a stall. A voice came from inside the stall. Excuse me, do you think I can get some help? The voice sounded like an elderly man. My TP ran away, <laughs> he chuckled. I slowly kicked the toilet paper closer to the stall when a hand grabbed my ankle from the open space under the stall. Ah! I writhed in pain, the nails digging deep in my skin. The hand pulled me towards the stall, causing my shin to break against the bottom of the wooden stall, sending splinters everywhere. My body fell with the pain, flat on the ground, and I began to be pulled underneath the bottom of the stall. It was Ronald. He crouched in the stall, makeup smeared with blood, and pulled me in. I told you I would fucking kill you, he growled. My screams of agony coming to a halt, I looked down at my shin that had struck the wood and saw the bottom of the leg bent perpendicular to the rest of it. The clown pulled out a knife and struck me in the arm, somehow making the unbearable pain worse. Just then, the bathroom door burst open as I heard my dad screaming my name, but everything began to go dark. The last image I saw was the clown raise the knife and strike my other arm. I let the darkness take me away. I awoke hours later in the hospital. I had two broken bones and multiple stab wounds. I had lost a lot of blood, but I was told I'd make a full recovery. Ronald McDonald was actually a man named Rick Dillard. He was an escape prisoner and registered sex offender. He had been living in hiding, coming out only in full costume and makeup to hide the face that had been plastered all over the news. Upon his arrest, police found pictures of other children in his apartment his next targets. I looked at death in the face and somehow managed to escape. I was lucky to have gotten out alive with nothing more than a phobia to clowns, two stab wounds on my arms, and an aversion towards McDonald's. To this day, despite being 37 years old and the diminished popularization of clowns around the world, fear and panic strikes deep at the sight of that restaurant and its mascot. My name is Zach. I don't consider myself a very special person. I'm studying psychology and I'm about to finish my degree. My life is not very different from any other person of my age, but it wasn't always like that. At the beginning of my career, I lived in a situation that would only happen in a movie. Something that changed my way of seeing people 
forever. It all started when I met my roommate, Isaac. He was the typical withdrawn boy. It was hard for him to communicate with other people, and that's why he was usually the victim of bullying from our other roommates. As time went by, I got to know him and discovered that he was a very nice person, only that he was bullied so much that no one could tell. Isaac was in love with a girl, but as if it were a teenage romance movie, the girl was the ex-girlfriend of one of the worst bullies in the place, so he was the victim of his attacks. One day, Isaac came to our room all beat up. He told me that he had been beaten up on campus for no reason. They just saw him and automatically attacked him. I told him to talk to the administrators, but we both knew that was not going to accomplish anything since they never intervene in student problems, no matter how serious they are. Isaac simply lay down on his bed, asked me not to make too much noise, and went to sleep. As he lay there, I could hear him crying softly, trying to hide it. After falling asleep, I woke up in the wee hours of the morning. I was too sleepy to understand what was going on, but after seeing what I saw, I woke up immediately. Isaac was on the side of the bed. He was fidgeting frantically while drawing scribbles with his pen on the floor. I ran to him to calm him down, but with superhuman strength, he threw himself at me and tried to stab me with a pen. I need him, and when I saw him confused, he cried again. At that moment, I realized that Isaac was really in bad shape and that he needed a friend. In the following days, I tried to convince him to go to a psychologist, but he refused to do it. I tried everything, but there was no solution. I came to think that the best way for Isaac to be happier is for him to meet the girl he wanted to meet so much, who just happened to be my friend. Behind Isaac's back, I arranged a blind date between the two of them. I told her about meeting a great friend, and I didn't say anything to him, just that he would wait for me at the school campus at 10 p.m. I knew that no one would interrupt them, since there was a big party an hour before, which the girl was not going to go to as to not bother her ex. After arranging everything, I went to the party hoping that Isaac would do well, and that's when I ran into the girl's ex-boyfriend, the man who mistreated Isaac all the time. We were all drinking, and I admit I had a little too much to drink, so I went over to face him. I grabbed him by the jacket and told him never to do anything to Isaac again, and his reaction surprised me. Instead of hitting me, instead of bringing his friends and starting a big fight, he just talked to me. Dude, are you Isaac's partner? Why are you defending such a psychopath? Psychopath? What do you mean? The little psycho harassed my ex-girlfriend for years. He used to sneak into her house before we were on campus, stand outside her house watching her, sending letters to her parents, and sneak into the school every time she came over. What? That can't be Isaac. Dude, I'm not a bully. You don't understand because you're new, but everyone stays away from Isaac for that reason. Since the college authorities don't do anything, we do our own justice. I blurted it out and was shocked. At first, everything he was telling me seemed crazy, but then it all started to make sense. How many times had I seen pictures of the girl at the desk? How many times had I seen Isaac behaving very suspiciously? How could I justify what I experienced the other night? While all those thoughts were going through my head, I remembered something else. I had organized a get-together between Isaac and the girl. Tonight. Without saying anything, I ran out of the party and headed for the campus. It was 10.20. Maybe I still had time to avoid a tragedy. When I arrived at the meeting point, there was no one there. I had the girl left when she saw Isaac. I thought about going back to our room to see if he was sleeping, crying, or doing something else. But suddenly I heard a scream coming from the gym. I ran as fast as I could and saw that the door was open. There were muddy footprints leading into it. One of them belonged to a girl, and behind her were those of a man. As I entered the gym, silence and darkness reigned. I entered slowly, waiting to hear something that would tell me where either of them were. After taking a few steps, I heard sobbing a few meters away, but I also heard a thump and someone falling. I approached slowly, prepared to meet anything, and, to my surprise, Isaac stepped out of the shadows. <clears throat> hey, what are you doing here? Isaac, what happened? I, I heard a scream. Don't worry. I was the one who screamed. 
She threw me out as soon as she saw me, and I came here to be alone. I'd like to continue to be alone, if you don't mind. I'll go to the room in a while. I just need to think for a while. Oh, of course, Isaac. I'll see you in the room. Call me if you need company, okay? Of course. Hey, Zach. Yeah? Thanks. I know what you did for me, and I'm really grateful. We are friends, man. Don't mention it. Isaac turned away, but I didn't. I knew that everything he told me was a lie. His face had many scratch marks, and the footprints that led us here were clearly female. Besides, that scream wasn't his. I waited for Isaac to let his guard down, and with all my energy I rammed him from behind and knocked him to the ground. Before he could react, I hit him and he quickly lost consciousness. He must have hit his head on the ground when he fell. I ran in the direction of the scream, and as I thought, the girl was on the ground. She was badly hurt. Someone had hit her. She was very weak. She had marks on her neck. Isaac had tried to strangle her. When she saw me, the girl started crying. I thought it was from happiness. I thought it was because I had saved her. But it was not. She was crying from fear, looking behind me. When I turned around, Isaac was gone. He wasn't passed out. He just pretended to be. I picked up the girl and began to carry her to the exit. As I carried her, I listened to Isaac running around the gym. All the steps generated a lot of echoes and the darkness was too much. I didn't know where he was going to attack, but Isaac was going to do it, sooner or later. As we were about to leave, the psychopath lunged at me with his knife and knocked me to the floor. We both struggled. He was never very muscular, but he had a relentless determination that was overcoming me. I could feel the knife millimeters away from sinking into my chest. There was nothing I could do. Had the girl managed to escape? If nothing else, I could make up for my mistake. Suddenly, Isaac's strength stopped, as if someone had pulled him out. The boy I had found at the party, Isaac's bully, was struggling with him, trying to pull the knife out. Isaac started to get the upper hand, but with all my strength I rammed him. The knife fell away from him, and we both lunged at Isaac, hitting him. The police arrived shortly after. The man told me that shortly after I left the party, the girl wrote that Isaac had locked her in the gym, so he came too. The police arrested the psycho for attempted murder, and I apologized to my friend. I would never have imagined that I would be manipulated by a psychopath. I learned that day that things are not always as they appear. If you meet such a person, be careful. You never know what secrets some people are hiding. Hi guys, my name is Isle. Many in the town I used to live in may not know this, but I'm a hero. Without me, my two innocent little boys would have been victims of something terrible. A being so dark and strange that if it weren't for that being attacking my children, I wouldn't have had the courage to face it face to face. To tell you the truth, I always considered myself a hero. As a kid, I was always the least popular in school. My schoolmates treated me very badly and the adults much worse. My parents were not at all proud of me. They told me that I was going to be a failure and that I was never going to achieve anything. But with hard work and effort, I proved them wrong. Eventually, I got married and had two beautiful children. As soon as I finished high school, I went to college in Antigua. But working in the big city was always something that made me uncomfortable. After a while, I decided to go back to the farm and take care of it. I may not have had an ostentatious life anymore, but you know what? I was happy. And as long as my wife and two children felt that way too, there was no way I could regret this huge decision. I still remember perfectly the day I became a hero. It all happened one morning when I was returning from shopping for my two children. Their mom was at home waiting for me to make lunch, but when I parked the truck, I noticed something was wrong. The boys were running into the cornfield, which I have always strictly forbidden them to do, as I lose sight of them. I was worried they were ignoring me and there had been many children missing in the last few weeks. I headed in their direction to scold them. But first, I was going to leave all the things from the store inside the house. Halfway there, the things I bought fell out of my surprise. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The scarecrow had moved on its own. It was impossible. Its bizarre straw face turned and began to look at me. 
then came to life and walked in the direction of the children. Oh my God, did you just see what I saw? No, it had to be a mistake. Is there a person inside the scarecrow? Honey, that's impossible. It's been there all day with a stick through it. Oh no, the children. Where are they? I just saw them running. Whatever it is, maybe it's behind them. Oh no, go save them. I'll call the police. Immediately after I saw that, I ran towards the farmyard shouting at the children. I saw them in the distance and they saw me. But for some reason, they panicked and ran even more. I didn't understand why they were so scared to see me. But when I turned around, I realized they weren't looking at me. Behind me, the scarecrow was standing imposingly. Somehow the strange being grabbed me with its soft hand and lifted me up smoothly. It began to choke me with a strength that I could not even consider human. Slowly losing my vision, I was fainting from lack of air. Suddenly, the scarecrow threw me to the ground and with brutal force used his hand to lift me up and slam me to the ground over and over again. I felt like my back was going to break. If I landed too badly on one of those falls, I could break my skull. If this being wanted to kill me, it could have done it while it was choking me, but it didn't. This being, whatever it had, could have killed me. This being, whatever he had in front of him, was cruel. He wanted to hurt me. He wanted to make me suffer. I had to get rid of him. I could not allow such a monster to be in front of my children. Suddenly, the scarecrow let go of me and tried to hang me to the ground. But this time, I was ready. With one big kick, I managed to knock him down and make him retreat a few centimeters. I took advantage of this small respite to run in the direction of my children. The trees were too high and I couldn't see them, but they started shouting so I could guess where they were. Dad, please, help us. Someone is after us. Behind me, I heard many noises. I was being followed by this being. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand how it could be alive, but I didn't care. I just wanted to protect my children. I got almost to the end of the field and found them on the side crying. Hey boys, don't cry. It's all over. I'll take you home and we'll have a nice meal. That scary monster won't hurt you, I promise. Please, get away from us. Daddy is coming. Don't hurt us. Poor kids. They were really shocked. They didn't even recognize me. I tried to grab them by the hands, but I felt something grab me from behind and threw me back against the masonry. I thought it was the scarecrow again. I was ready to fight for my children. But no, it was an ordinary man. My children ran to him. For some reason, they called him daddy. Had they gone crazy? The man stood guard, waiting to attack me if I went first. But soon after, he was joined by other men I recognized from the neighborhood. They all grabbed me and started holding me. Did they think I was the one attacking the children? My own children? The men kicked me to the ground and held me against the fence. I don't know why these people that I'd grown up with, my own neighbors, that I've known all my life were doing something like this to me, but I didn't care. I was not going to let these people kidnap my children. Nothing was going to get me away from my children. In a moment of energy, I managed to free myself from the men who were pressing me against the fence and I jumped towards the children with a huge leap. In any case, I was going to hug them and take them as far away as possible, no matter how far I had to run to get them out of danger. Suddenly, the man my children called their father caught me before I could get to the children. Once he caught me, we both fell to the ground and started fighting. Everyone was trying to separate us, but at the same time, they were trying to hit me. Little by little, I began to lose strength and the will to fight. I couldn't resist anymore. I had failed my children. I began to lose consciousness as I saw how behind all these people, the scarecrow was standing, staring at me with a huge smile. Soon after, the police arrived and they took me into custody. I told them everything that had happened and for some reason, they didn't believe me. To make it worse, they went to my house and found a room with my ten other children. I told them that they were my children, like the ones I had saved that day, but they didn't believe me. They took me to court and concluded that I have to go to a center for crazy people to recover. The doctors told me that I have a problem in my head called schizophrenia. I was told that I see and hear things that aren't really there, like the scarecrow. They also told me that I tend to take someone else's children and take them with me, and that with time, I will get better. How dare they tell me that my life is a lie? That I don't really have a wife or children, and that everything happens inside my head? I always tell them 
yes, and pretend they are right. Only I know the truth, and the truth is that I am a hero. The world is not ready to know that there are things beyond their knowledge. I just hope that Scary Scarecrow doesn't attack again. As soon as I am free, I'm going to keep being a hero. I'm going to save as many children as I can. Have you ever been treated by a bad doctor? You know, those doctors who don't care about you. Those few doctors who are tired of people and just want to go home. Every time I think back to that day, I think that I would have preferred to be treated by one of these doctors. I would have preferred to see anyone other than the one I saw. It all started when I was 18 years old. It was a very immature time for me. I was too young and innocent to be able to fend for myself, but too old and rebellious to let my parents interfere with my life. We went to the hospital for a sinus infection, and when it was my turn to go to the doctor's office, I insisted on going in alone. When I entered the office, the doctor was waiting for me behind his desk. At that point, neither I nor my parents had seen the signs. We didn't notice that the doctor's voice signaling for the next patient to come in was different. We didn't notice that the previous patient had never left the office before I was called in. And we definitely didn't notice the doctor locked the door when I walked in. After entering, he asked me what was wrong with me, why I was there. He didn't look like a doctor. He was unalienated, nervous, and even seemed quite angry. His voice was impatient and shaky, but it felt like he was holding back the anger in his eyes. He told me to lie down on the bed. He grabbed one of those little sticks used to check the throat, but without warning, he shoved it in violently ah. into my nose. The man squeezed harder and harder as if <laughs> amused by what he was doing. Scared, I pushed him away. Hey man, what's your problem, man? <laughs> Relax, young boy. I understand the procedure might be quite painful, but no mistakes. It is normal. That can't be normal. This is the first time I heard about this procedure. That is because this is a new procedure. Are you questioning a doctor, kid? Do you think you know more than me? I, I guess I don't. Sorry. I overreacted. That hurt it. Just go back to your seat. You will feel better after this. At that point, I should have left. I should have screamed. I saw his psychotic eyes. I saw his macabre smile, but still, I trusted him. I sat back down, asking him not to use those sticks anymore. He started massaging my forehead to see if it hurt, a typical sinusitis procedure to see if I had mucus on my forehead. Everything was starting to go normal. But the procedure the man was applying on my forehead was getting stronger and stronger. I begged him to stop, that it hurt, but he wouldn't. He just increased the pressure more and more, slowly directing it toward my eyes instead of my forehead. I tried to pull his hands away and kick him, but nothing worked. It was as if he was totally fixed on hurting me. I screamed as loud as I could, and with all of my strength, I gave him one last kick that threw him into a locker. Hey! What is happening? Open the door. What are you doing to our son? My parents were trying to ram the door without success while I watched the doctor recovering from the impact. The locker was still closed, but the impact shook it a little and blood began to flow from its openings. There was a corpse inside the locker. At my discovery, he just grinned even bigger from ear to ear and walked in my direction, pulling a scalpel out of his pocket. I heard more and more voices on the other side, but the door was very solid and would not open. The doctor was almost beside me. I had to do something. I gathered all the energy I had and tried to ram him, but it backfired as he gave me a violent blow that knocked me backwards. He just kept approaching me as if nothing had happened with that terrifying and maniacal smile. What are you doing? You're not a doctor, are you? Why are you doing this to me? I may not be licensed, but I know my medicine. I may not have the best intentions, but I consider myself a doctor. <laughs> you know you came in here feeling bad. 
But when I'm done with you, you won't feel bad anymore. You won't feel <laughs> anything. <laughs> why? Why? You're asking me why? Because it's fucking funny. The blood, the pain that you trusted me. I'm having the time of my life. Once he said this, the men lunged at me with a scalpel. I had to think fast and did the only thing I could think of. I used all my energy to throw myself out of the second floor window. As I fell, I felt the glass cutting through my body. But I felt no pain. Only adrenaline and fear. The fall took forever. And as I kept falling, I saw the psychopath behind me. He had also jumped? Maybe he was hallucinating. As soon as I reached the bottom, I only remember an impact and suddenly darkness. I woke up in the hospital bed with a broken leg. My parents received me crying and told me everything that happened. Once I jumped out the window, the man jumped behind me with an uncontrollable thirst for blood. Unfortunately for him, he fell very badly, and even though it wasn't that big of a fall, he didn't survive. When the police inspected the office, they found the body of the real doctor in the locker. That was not my doctor, but a patient who had taken his place. My leg may have recovered, but in my head, I could never get over what happened. Every time I go to the hospital, I'm terrified of who might treat me. That psychopath may be dead, but in my head, he is more alive than ever. Public transportation is the most accessible mode of transportation for a lot of people around the world, especially people who can afford a car or private transportation have the option of public transportation. It could be buses, trains, subways, etc. But what should a person do when their safety is in question while traveling on public transport? One such incident happened to me when I was at my university, and to date, I am terrified to travel alone on a bus. When I was around 19, and in my second year of college, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. It was really tough news for me and my parents to digest. I had a younger brother who was 12 at the time and was in school. Before the diagnosis, my mother was the pillar that held our house together. But the moment she was diagnosed and her treatment began, my dad was struggling to keep everything together. He had to take care of the house, look after my brother, take mom to her appointments, and do his job. Without me there, I could see my family going through a rough time, not just financially, but emotionally and mentally too. So I decided to go back home on weekends to help dad with everything. I took a part-time job in my college's library to earn some money to support my house. My college was just a two-hour drive away from my home. However, I did not have a car back then. So instead, I used to take a bus every Friday evening and Monday morning to get back and forth from my home to my college. I had taken the bus a lot of times, so I never really worried about traveling in it. I always carried my weekend bag, some books to study, and anything else I'd need for my stay. Usually, I'd take the bus around 7 in the evening and get home by 9 or 9.30 the latest. I really enjoyed the bus ride, as it was the only time in my week I'd get some peace. I could either take a nap, complete my projects, read books, or just listen to music. However, one day, I got a phone call from my little brother telling me that our mom was hospitalized. He didn't know the exact reason for her immediate hospitalization, but he begged me to come home, as he was alone and Dad was in the hospital with Mom. It was a Wednesday, and the time was around 8 in the evening. I was in no way prepared to go home, but I knew I had to be there for my family. So I quickly packed up a small duffel bag, threw in everything that I would need, and rushed to the bus stop. I knew very well that the last bus to my hometown left at 9 p.m., I somehow managed to reach the bus stop by 8.45. I was so worried and scared and felt so hopeless. I was trying to call my dad to know how mom was doing and also to inform him that I would be coming home sometime before midnight and that I would look after my brother. His phone was either engaged or out of coverage area. I finally called William on the landline and told him to hang on until I arrived. He was a very smart kid for his age. While I was waiting for the bus and talking on the phone, I did not realize that two tall and lean teen boys 
were standing close to me at the bus stop as well. Usually when I took the 7 p.m. bus, it used to have a lot of passengers on it. Therefore, I always felt safe to travel alone. But this time, I realized that the bus stop was deserted, except for me and the two suspicious-looking teens. I decided not to react unless the two tried to do something funny. I wasn't going to be the person who judged others over their appearance. And so far, the boys had done nothing except stand and talk to one another. I just hoped for the bus to arrive soon so that I could get to my brother as fast as I could. Then suddenly, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turn around to find the boy standing oddly close to me. He was almost in my personal space. From so close, I could make out the freckles on his pale skin, and he did not have any facial hair as well, so he was definitely 16 or maybe 17. Both of them looked around the same age. Yes, I said. The boy standing in front of me said, I'm Billy, and that's Mark. We were wondering if you had a boyfriend. This immediately raised a ton of red flags and warning signs in my mind. Being in college for two years had taught me enough. I knew what it meant when a guy asked a girl if she had a boyfriend. That's when I knew these two were up to no good. And even though they were younger than me, they had a good foot of height over me and just as many pounds. If they wanted, they could easily overpower my short, petite frame. I took a few steps back and told them to back off and that I wasn't interested in their antics. But the kids were persistent. They kept hitting on me. They asked if I wanted to go back to their place for a little while and if I was up to having some fun with them. They told me they could make me feel really good. And all of their comments made me want to puke. They looked like punks and I couldn't take it anymore. Shut up, you two! I yelled at them while clutching my duffel bag and my phone. My sudden outburst seemed to take them back as they did not expect such a reaction from me. And just then, the bus finally arrived. I thought I would get rid of them once I got into the bus, but to my utter shock, the two boys climbed onto the bus after me. The bus was unusually empty, except for the driver, me, and the two boys, and an elderly man sitting in the back seat. I knew if push come to shove, there would be no one to save me from these thugs. I sat in the middle where I usually sit, and the boys took a seat too. One sat on the seat behind me, and the other in front of me. This time, I was really freaked. I contemplated calling my dad, but I knew he'd be worried to death with my mom already, so I didn't call to bother him. I knew I had to stand up for myself, and no one would come to save me. I sat near the window, and I could feel the guy sitting behind me playing with my hair. So I tied up my hair in a bun. That's when the guy sitting in front of me turned around and grabbed my neck, pulling me in towards him, and crashed his lips across my mouth. He started hissing me. I wanted to push him away, but the guy behind me held my hands behind my back. I could not do much. I was trapped. I wiggled my head and body to get out of their grip, but the boys were strong. I could not even scream. That's when someone ripped Billy's mouth from mine, and Mark, too, let go of my hands at the same time. I was in tears and so scared. I barely managed to look up and saw the same old man who was sitting in the back standing by my seat, looking at me worried. Are you okay, miss? He asked me. I was so scared and traumatized that I barely managed to nod. Mark was sitting still behind me. But Billy did not want to give up. Do you have any problem, old man? I think you should go and sit back in your seat. Or else we will break all your old bones. The old man chuckled and then slightly moved the lapel of his blazer, revealing a gun in a holster strapped to his abdomen. The moment Billy saw the gun, he paled and slumped in his seat. If you touch, let alone look at this lady again... I will blow your brains out. I do not have many years to live anyways. I can spend the rest of my life behind bars for putting two idiots and potential rapists six feet under. But you boys are not even twenty yet. You'd lose your lives in the process. The choice is yours. You could get down at the next stop and behave yourselves. Or... 
be ready to meet your maker. The man stood there while Mark and Billy walked to take their seat in the front right behind the driver. The man took a seat in front of me and said nothing while I sobbed uncontrollably. As the bus stopped at the next stop, the two teens got off. However, there were cops waiting by the bus station and they immediately arrested the two. They stopped the bus, walked up to the old man, and greeted him as if he were an old friend. They made sure I was all right, and that's when I got to know that the old man was a retired Marine and retired sheriff. He had the permit to carry the gun and use it if need be. I finally reached home safely, and to date, I am glad that the old man saved me from the two idiotic and violent teenagers. After that day, I bought a second-hand car and started driving back and forth from college to home. I never took the bus again. Do you understand how tough it is to get a decent job in this declining economy? If you do, you would understand the importance of a single job offer. Today I'm about to tell you how I landed the worst job of my life. This is an incident that happened back in 2008 when the recession was rampant and people were losing their jobs left and right. Back when I used to work in a call center, the job didn't pay well, but I was able to pay my bills and keep a roof over my head. But then the recession hit, and a bunch of us were fired. I was left with no job and a big stack of unpaid bills. The internet wasn't as accessible all those years ago as it is now, so the only two ways to get a job were to look for job ads in the newspapers or through referrals. After spending a month jobless and only on water and ramen noodles, one day I finally saw a job ad in the newspaper cleaning staff hiring for boys boarding school. I had no experience in cleaning, let alone in a boarding school. The job was in another state, which meant I had to uproot my life here and move there for good. Luckily, I had no family or a permanent house, so I didn't mind taking up the job. And the pay was too good for a single guy. I called the number mentioned in the ad and was scheduled for an on-the-phone interview. A few days later, I was interviewed and was selected for the job. That was the first time when I was told during the interview itself that I would got the job. They mailed me my flight ticket and wanted me there as soon as possible. I took no time in packing my stuff and selling the things I couldn't take with me, and I was off to take up my new position. I knew the position wasn't anything fancy like a Wall Street banker or a lawyer, but I think as a simple high school graduate, this was the best thing I could do in times of recession. When I got there, a car picked me up and took me to the boarding school. On the drive there, I realized how isolated the school was, sitting on top of a hill. The car stopped in front of a small apartment building. Apparently, I would be staying in one of the apartments in this building with another roommate. I met some of the staff working in the school, and they all seemed a bit aloof, as if they didn't want me there. I didn't mind that treatment as I wouldn't be interacting with most of the people on a regular basis. In my interview, it was specified that I'd be cleaning the school after school hours, after everyone was gone for the day. I was to clean from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. I was fine with that as the school was on the same campus as my apartment building and to the extreme right side of the campus was the boys' dormitory. Originally, the boys were housed in the school itself, on the top five floors. But just last year, a new dormitory was constructed for the kids, and now the old school building was used just as a school. On my first day of work, I met two other cleaning staff members. Melissa, the old woman who swept the school grounds, and Roni, a middle-aged man who cleaned the toilets. It was a bit surprising that there were only three people employed to keep such a big school clean. My job was to sweep dust and wipe all the classrooms that were currently in use. I also had to keep the principal's room and the staff room clean. When I was told my part, I asked Melissa why the school didn't hire more cleaning staff members. All she told me was that no one ever stuck around. Also, Ronnie was mute and he didn't like to interact with people. Lastly, Melissa told me that I'm not supposed to go on the third floor and all the floors above it, no matter what, as those floors were off limits for everyone. It was the easiest job of my life, I admit it. I plugged my earphones in, played some rock music, and began cleaning. I didn't even realize how fast time flew by and how much work I'd already finished. 
By the time I got to my apartment, my roommate, who was a math teacher in the same school, was busy grading test papers, and I decided to grab a quick dinner and call it a day. The next couple of days passed in the same way. All the boys in the school seemed to well behave, not that I got any chance to interact with them. But one thing that I noticed was the fact that all the people were reserved and aloof. No one really spoke to anyone other than work. It was as if a gloomy cloud was forever lingering over the school. I tried speaking to the people, but to no avail, so I just gamed up and did my work. When I received my first paycheck, I was so happy that I was finally back on my feet. The very next day, I was working in one of the classrooms on the second floor, which was the closest to the stairs leading to the upper floors. Suddenly, the music blasting through my earphones stopped, and I heard the laughter of a little boy. It was only six, so I thought maybe it was one of the boys. I walked out of the classroom and heard the laughter again. However, this time, it was coming from upstairs. I decided to go check out who it was and what they were doing there. I climbed the stairs and suddenly felt a heavy weight on me. It was as if someone was sitting on my shoulders. I'm a pretty brave guy, so I ignored it and kept walking. As I got up, the laughter <laughs> continued and now it felt like the voice was near me. I checked the corridor to my left and found it empty. So I turned to check the right corridor, which was much longer than the left. I heard giggling and laughter, so I walked to check out who was there. At the end of the corridor, I saw a boy. He may have been seven years old. He had fair skin, green eyes, and a mop of shaggy curly hair. He was smiling at me, and he looked so sweet and innocent. I smiled at him back and was about to ask him what he was doing there, when I heard another giggle right <laughs> behind me. I turned to see if another child was there, but to my utter shock and surprise, the same boy was standing behind me. Frantically, I turned to see if the boy I had seen initially was there or not, but right there at the end of the corridor was the boy. He had a creepy smile on his face. It spooked me, and then, out of nowhere, his head fell off of his shoulders, and there was blood everywhere. Then someone tapped me on my shoulder. And there was the boy, headless and holding a bloody knife in his hand. The last thing I remembered was running, trying to get away from the boy. When I opened my eyes, a bright light was on my face and three people were standing around me. When my eyes opened fully, I saw the principal, my roommate, the math teacher, and a doctor. <sighs> what happened to me? Why am I in the hospital? This morning, you were found unconscious on the third floor by Ronnie, the principal said. Can you tell me what you were doing there, despite us warning you not to step a foot there? I narrated the whole incident to them, even though my head was throbbing. When I touched my forehead, it was wrapped in band-aids and I could feel stitches. You hit your head on the floor when you fainted, so we had to get you stitched up. You'll be fine in a week or so, the doctor told me. The math teacher and our principal were looking at me worried. Soon I was discharged, and on the drive back home, I asked the principal the truth about the boarding school. Two years ago, a horrible incident happened in the boarding school. No one talks about it, really. One morning, as Ronnie was cleaning the toilets and washrooms on the third floor, he discovered something on the end of the third floor corridor, right where he found you passed out and bleeding. It was the head of a little boy. One of our students. That was the only time I heard Ronnie screaming. He followed the trail of blood coming from the head and found the rest of the boy's body. It was a big scandal. And the cops were never able to catch the murderer. They say it was a hate crime. A jealous kid did it. Then they blamed it on the staff and also on some serial killer. But the case went cold soon, and no one was punished for taking the life of an innocent boy. But the terror did not end there. Soon many kids and staff members reported seeing the headless boy on the third floor. That's why we had to construct a new kid's dormitory and close the upper floors of the school. That night, I collected my paycheck 
packed my stuff, and moved back to the city. Once again jobless, but much, much safer. What do you think about when I say the words, a country farm? <laughs> Let me guess. A big plot of land with a small house in the middle, surrounded by lush green grass, and a field off in the distance. Maybe a stable sheltering some cattle and horses. A small fenced area for sheep and a coop for hens. An old man tending to all the animals, wearing denim overalls and a cowboy hat. If this is the picture that comes before your eyes, then let me tell you that you are absolutely correct. Back in Missouri, my parents had a similar farm. Spread on eight acres of land, our farm was a paradise for both humans and animals. We had three horses, five cows, seven hens, five pigs, and three acres of farmland, with a cozy two-story house in the middle. Also, we had a farm dog named Toby. My parents had inherited this farm and the house from my dad's parents, and my dad's parents had inherited the farm from my granddad's parents. So this farm had been in our family for generations. My parents loved the place and the animals, and so did me and my three siblings. I have two elder sisters and one younger sister. I'm the only boy. And growing up, I had my fair share of pretend tea parties, Barbies and fake makeup sessions. And to a degree, I enjoyed all of that. But as a boy, I loved to play ball and just run around the house. Lucky me, so did all three of my sisters. And each of them were only a year apart, so it wasn't a huge age difference. Which meant I had three friends to play with at home. All four of us were pretty tight and often played outside our house or tended to the animals. However, amongst all the pleasant memories, there's one terrible incident that sticks out like a sore thumb, even today. We've all moved to different states to pursue our careers and live out our lives, but whenever we gather back at the farm, we always discuss what happened that day. I was around 10, my younger sister Gemma was 9. Lola, my eldest sister, was 12, and Jenna was 11. After school, we were all playing catch on the far side of the farm, where trees and weeds had overgrown and created a mini forest. Our parents never allowed us to go there, as there could be snakes or other creatures that might hurt us there. But whenever our parents weren't home, we sneaked out to play there. That day, our mom was visiting our aunt, and dad was in town to run some errands. Our babysitter, Mrs. Ford, was a 78-year-old lady who could barely see a few feet ahead and was in the kitchen, thinking we were all in our rooms. Usually, whenever we played in this area, or anywhere on the farm for that matter, Toby, our pet dog, used to always be with us, fetching the ball when it went too far or in the bushes. But that day, Dad had taken him away with him, so it was just the four of us instead of the five of us. As usual, we were playing catch, when Gemma, our youngest sister, missed the ball that Jenna had thrown at her. Unfortunately, the ball went somewhere deep into the thicket of trees and bushes, which had grown way past our height. Usually, Toby would sniff out the ball and get it back within minutes, but today it was just us. Lola, the eldest, decided to go in and get the ball, but I didn't let her go in, as I knew her dress might get stuck on a twig or a thorn. Instead, I was short and swift, so I decided to go get it. This was the first time any of us was entering the mini forest, so we were a bit scared. Plus, the sun was about to set soon, which meant Mom and Dad would be back. And if one of them caught us here, we would surely be grounded. Plus, Lola would get scolded for letting us come here. So, I knew I had to be fast, or else risk the wrath of our parents. The mini forest had been there ever since I remember. Dad said that it was a part of the property, and even Grandpa didn't touch it, so naturally neither Dad nor Mom tended to this part at all. I slipped into the overgrown trees and bushes as my sisters waited out for me. Lola called out to me every two to three minutes to make sure I was all right. I replied to her as I kept going into the forest. It was quite tough to navigate. I still remember struggling to take each step. There were branches everywhere. Dead leaves littered the ground, making it difficult to see where I was stepping. I even scratched my arms and my feet with thorns sticking out of the shrubs. But there was no sight of our ball. I really wished I could smell like Toby so I could fetch the ball and get out of there. However, after a few minutes, I stopped hearing Lola's voice, 
which meant I was deep into it now. Suddenly, I heard a hissing sound a few feet away from me, and before I could figure out what it was, a snake coiled a few feet in front of me. It was hissing and slowly creeping towards me. I instantly turned around and started running, but due to the dim dusk light and the overgrowth, I could make a quick escape, and the snake was right behind me. Tears welled up in my eyes, which made it difficult for me to see ahead, but I kept running. However, it happened so suddenly that I didn't even realize how just a minute ago I was running, and then the next I was on my ass in the mud with bleeding knees and tears running down my cheeks. The snake was right in front of me, and at any moment now he was going to bite, and I would be left here in this stupid forest. But suddenly, in the opposite direction, I could hear barks, and then I spotted a dog with golden fur. It was a golden retriever. It wasn't a dog I had seen before. This dog attacked the snake from behind with its paws. Immediately, the snake changed its target and now it was defending itself from the dog rather than attacking me. I remember thinking how brave the dog was, and secondly, whose dog was it? I'd never seen it on our property or in the neighborhood before. Soon, the dog had somehow managed to shoo off the snake, which disappeared into the bushes, hissing and slithering away. Then the dog came towards me and started licking my bruised hands and bleeding feet. This made me laugh a bit, so I pet the dog and noticed an old weathered collar around its neck. It had the name tag, Sebastian. The dog's name was Sebastian, and somehow, the name suited him. He helped me to get up slowly and then led the way back towards my waiting siblings. But just before I got out of the mini forest, the golden retriever wandered back into the trees. The moment I was out, I was snatched into a hug by my mom. She looked worried and instead of scolding me, she just held me tight. Looking at my bleeding and bruised state, my little sisters began to cry. Mom took us all back to the house and took care of my wounds. I told her and my sisters what had happened inside the forest. I told them all about Sebastian and the snake and how he'd helped me. As soon as Dad returned home, Mom narrated the whole incident to him and asked him to clear the forest the next day. Looking at my state, he agreed, and the next day he hired a few men to cut the bushes and trim the branches. And that day, what they found really stunned us. There, underneath all the overgrowth, we found two graves, one of a ten-year-old boy called Alexander Henderson. On the grave were the words, Loving son, brother, and friend, we miss you, Alex, and you will always be in our memories. And right next to it was a grave with a dog face carved on it. On this grave were the words, A loving friend who defended his best buddy till death. We love you, Sabby, and we will miss you too. The grave was addressed to a dog, a golden retriever called Sebastian. My whole family was shocked to know that Sebastian had died almost 80 years ago. I had spoken of the dog non-stop the whole evening after I returned home the previous night. Tears welled up in my eyes again and I was so confused. So Dad decided to do some digging and found out the most shocking story. Turns out my great-grandfather had a son called Alex, who passed away at 10. He was the youngest and often played on the farm with his dog Sebastian. One day while playing, he was bitten by a snake and Sebastian rushed to his rescue. He died trying to save his friend, and neither he nor Alex made it. They both were buried on the property beside one another, forever together. So the only conclusion we came up with was that Sebastian's spirit returned to save another little boy from a snake attack, the one thing he couldn't do for his own best friend. We never saw Sebastian again on the property, and I often visited his grave with Toby. I still do, and I'm forever thankful to him for saving my life that evening. However, while clearing the mini forest, we never got our ball back. Seems like Sebastian maybe took it to play in heaven with Alex. Do you know what it feels like to one day pack up all your things and then leave your home behind as a child and move into a new place, thousands of miles away from your home? I do, because as a child my father decided to ship me off to a boarding school. 
This was during the 1980s. I was 10, and instead of enrolling me in the local public school, my father thought that a boarding school would help me build my character. And so, I was in a boys' boarding school at the age of 10, starting my 5th grade year. Now, before I move on with my story, let me describe the layout of the school for you. This school was like a Romanian palace. It was built in the 18th century and was converted into a boys' boarding school after the Second World War. Boys from all over the country and even from Europe were enrolled here. It was a place for the rich to dispose of their kids, to avoid dealing with them. And given that my father was pretty wealthy himself, I fit right in. The school began at 7 a.m. in the morning, with breakfast served at 6. Then we had classes till 1 in the afternoon, and then some time to go back to our dorms and rest. Around 4, we had study sessions in the classrooms, or the massive two-story library, till 6 in the evening. After that, we were allowed to play a sport of our choice till 8 in the evening, and then dinner was served. We were in bed by 9 in the evening. Life seemed pretty structured on paper, but in reality, it was hell. The rigid schedule was hard to keep up with, and my roommates were mean. On Sunday, however, we were allowed to sleep in a bit, and that was the only time we were allowed to have visitors. My parents hardly ever came to visit me, so I mostly just read in my room. Around three months into my stay in the boarding school, my three roommates put a dead snake in my bed, and that was when I lost it. I wrote my first letter back home asking my parents to get me out of this wretched boarding school. Instead, my mom visited me, spoke to the dean, and moved me into a new room. This new room had only one other boy living in it. His name was Caden. Caden was from France. He was one of the few foreign students in our grade. And in my new room, instead of having four separate beds, we only had one bunk bed, and Caden slept on the lower bunk, which means I was stuck with the top bunk. Now, there was a legend in our boarding school that whoever slept on the top bunk experienced weird paranormal phenomena. So when my old roommates got to know I had the top bunk, they started harassing me during class. I was 10, and sure enough, all the legends going around did scare me a bit. The first week, I slept like a baby. Caden and I had become good friends, and everything was peaceful in my life for a long while. I was getting much-needed sleep and wasn't getting bullied. However, I think Caden had nightmares. He shivered and shook in his bed too much at night, which made my top bunk shake too. The first few times I ignored it and went back to sleep, but as the days passed every night, it seemed as if Caden's condition was worsening, so I finally decided to ask him about it. Hey, Caden, are you getting any kind of help to deal with your nightmares? I asked him casually while we were at dinner. A nightmares? What are you talking about? I do not have nightmares. You may not know this, but you shake and shiver every night in bed. This made Caden concerned, and I told him that if he started shaking at night again, I would wake him up. And that night, my bunk bed did start shaking, so I decided to wake Caden up. But when I looked below for my bed, Caden was sleeping peacefully. However, my bed was still shaking, which only meant one thing. There was an earthquake. I quickly got out of my bed, ready to wake up Caden and get out of the room. But the moment I landed, everything stopped. The ground was no longer shaking, which confused me. But as I was going back up to my bunk, I saw a dark figure standing in one corner. It looked like a boy around my age was just standing there. My first thought was... Maybe the boys from my old room were pulling another prank on me, so I walked towards the boy. But just as I was going to touch his shoulder, he opened his eyes, and they were glowing red. He wasn't a boy, but something paranormal, perhaps demonic. I stumbled backward and fell on my ass. The boy was standing there, staring at me. I was so terrified that I somehow managed to get back to bed before I could do anything. Caden had switched on the lights at our room and was beside me asking what was wrong. The moment the lights turned on, the boy disappeared. It took me some time to compose myself, but I told Caden everything I had seen. 
That was the second time I had written to my parents to come and get me. But this time, my dad visited me, and instead of understanding, he gave me a lecture on how I was a young man now and how I should make such a big deal out of a small situation. From that day onwards, every night, I saw the boy. Sometimes standing in the corner or sometimes sitting on the ceiling fan. But Caden could never see him. The boy, or the evil spirit, was haunting only me. But seeing the boy in my room was nothing compared to what happened that night. My last night in the boarding school. After which, I went home for good. As usual, we got to bed at nine in the evening. I was trying very hard to sleep when I felt something tug on my ankle. I usually slept with a duvet covering my whole body, so when I looked down to see what it was, I saw two red glowing eyes staring at me. Before I could move, the shadow boy was sitting on my chest, squeezing my neck. I was thrashing in bed to somehow get the boy off of me, but he was choking me. In my attempts to get the boy away from me, I moved too close to the edge of my bed and fell down. I broke my left arm and hip. My parents were informed and they took me back home. The doctor said it was a bad case of sleep paralysis combined with nightmares, but I truly believed that the room was haunted and an evil spirit of a little boy had attacked me. What do you guys think? Have you ever been on a farm? When people come to visit me at my farm, they usually think it's a boring place with no technology and people who are not civilized. They couldn't be more wrong. Today on farms, there's Wi-Fi, computers, and much more technology than they think. But it wasn't always like this. When I was growing up, there were still some people who hated technology, but even more, the city people who brought it. At the time I met such a person, I was only a teenager. I had gone to visit my uncle's farm. He liked technology, but didn't understand anything about it. That same day, he went shopping in town while I stayed on the farm all alone. Excited to be there, I wanted to scout the area with my drone. At the time, they weren't as popular as they are now, but my father collected them and knew I could be trusted to play with one of them while I was out. I turned on the drone and started flying it all over the farm. I got past the farm and went to the neighbor's house, but when I did, something strange happened. Someone threw a rock at my drone. As I redirected the drone back to the house, I noticed a person come out where the rock was thrown and stare at it. The man was terrifying. He was dressed like a bearded hillbilly that you saw in old movies. The man was gigantic and his eyes denoted terrible anger. Why was the man so enraged? I drove the drone to the house, but when I realized the man was behind it chasing the drone. As soon as I entered the house through the upstairs window, the man was in front of the door, kicking it open. I remember that man. Not because I had ever seen him, but because my uncle had told me about him. He warned me never to try to go near him or his farm. He is extremely dangerous and has not only fought many times with my uncle, but with everyone who got too close to him. I hid in the closet while the man screamed at the top of his lungs in the house, breaking everything in sight. Without wasting much time, the man came upstairs and started looking for me. With great force, he lifted the bed to look for me and threw it against the wall with frightening ease. Meanwhile, I was trying not to cry, but I couldn't hold myself and he heard me. He opened the closet door, violently pulling me out and lifted me with one hand. The man threw me violently as if I were a rag doll and I put myself on the ground to defend myself. Although my real intention was to run as soon as I had the chance. I tried to attack him, but he just dodged me laughing. At a moment when he thought I was going to throw myself at him, I took the opportunity to run as fast as I could, but it was in vain. In one leap, he blocked my path. Ahead of me, he was much more intimidating than I thought. I was not only a teenager, but a very weak one. I was always a very short boy with a tiny body frame. I was never in a fight and gym class was never my favorite. On the other hand, this man was a beast. He was over six feet, two inches tall. His body, despite being skinny, was very muscular. It was very easy to see that he trained, and a lot. The man insulted me in the most violent and threatening way possible. 
He told me that he hated city people like me. People who thought we could invade his property without the slightest interest in him. People who would destroy the peace of the farm by bringing in noise and technology. He told me that he didn't care that I was a child since when I grew up, I would surely be the same. My only response was to cry and cry. I was helpless in front of this monster who seemed to get angrier and angrier with each passing second. Even more empowered by his own anger, he lunged at me with both hands and began to choke me. His hands were strong and hard. At that moment, I thought I would die, either by running out of air or by him breaking my neck. The man started to shake me, and in an act of bravery, I bit his hand. Out, oh, little brat, how dare you? Let me go. I thought he was going to release me from the pain, but I only made him angrier, and his response was horrendous. Grabbing me by the neck, he took me to the drone and stomped on it until it broke. Once he was done with it, he threw me out the window. I remember the fall lasted only two seconds, but it felt like it had been going on for hours. When I fell, I didn't feel anything, or at least, I don't remember it. I woke up a few days later in the city hospital. I found out that I almost didn't survive, and that if my uncle hadn't arrived on time that day, I wouldn't have made it, as the man came downstairs and was ready to finish his work. My uncle ended up injured in the fight with him, but at least it was not in vain as shortly thereafter, the police arrested him and locked him up for attempted murder. Today, my uncle is no longer with us. I'm in charge of his farm now. The man's house was left uninhabited as he never returned and no one came to claim it. Every time I pass by, I remember that day. I remember how the man stormed out of the house, ready to hurt an innocent boy. After that, I just turn my head away. There are memories that are not worth reliving. It was my freshman year and I had just moved into my new dorm room that I shared with two other senior girls, Alice and Veronica. Our dorm room was like a three-bedroom apartment with two bathrooms we shared. As it was my first year, I partied at every chance I got. Alice and Veronica were pretty introverted, and hardly went out to any parties. We weren't the best of friends, but I knew my roommates enough to know they loved staying in the dorm and watching movies on weekends. On one such night, I went out to a frat party I was invited to by my classmates. I never really returned before 2 a.m., so most of the nights when I came back from such parties, both of my roommates were fast asleep. That night, too, I returned at around 1 a.m. I was hoping that the two ladies would be sleeping, but when I walked into our living room, the sofa was occupied by a middle-aged man. He looked as if he had been sleeping there before I entered, but now he was awake and looking at me. He had the duvet, I recalled to be Veronica's, up to his neck and I could only see his face. His eyes were a little red. I remembered Alice mentioning the other day that Veronica's older cousin was going to live with us for a while. But she did not mention how old this cousin was, but she did not mention how old this cousin was going to be, and if it was a male cousin or a female. I assumed the man in the living room to be her cousin. I grabbed a water bottle and went into my room. All the time I was in the living room, the man kept on staring at me. I usually do not lock my bedroom door, but this time a small part of me forced me to lock it. Soon I was laying in my bed watching some YouTube videos, which eventually led me to sleep. I woke up to a continuous scratching sound on my bedroom door. It was like a dog or an animal with big nails was scratching on it. But none of my roommates nor I had a dog or any pet animal. When I tried to focus and listened carefully, I could hear faint footsteps walking in front of my door with the scratching noise coming periodically. 
My gut instinct told me to text my roommates, and I did. I texted. Guys, someone is scratching on my door. Could it be your cousin Veronica? I did not receive any reply from them, so I decided to stay in my room and wait for Veronica to take her cousin away. But that did not happen, even after half an hour and the scratching continued. I tried calling my friends several times, but they did not pick up. Finally, I gathered the courage to press my ear against my bedroom door to gauge the situation, and I could hear the faint ringing of one of my roommate's phones across the hall. The man on the couch, or my roommate's cousin, was still out there pacing in the hallway in front of my room. I stood right by my door until the footsteps stopped. I dared to open my door, and as soon as I peeked out, something hard hit my head and I fell to the ground. It was as if he was waiting for an opportunity to attack me. The last thing I remember before everything blacked out was the face of the man who I thought was Veronica's cousin. A few hours later, I woke up in a police station. I was sleeping on a small bed, and as I gained consciousness, both of my hands were cuffed to the bed. One nurse shouted that I was awake, and a doctor stepped in to check my vitals. As soon as he left, two cops and one detective entered the room and asked me why I killed my roommates. I was shocked, would be an understatement to define how I felt. Firstly, it was heartbreaking that my roommates had died, but being accused of their murder was insanity. I was the one who was attacked, so I tried telling the cops and the detective what had happened to me and how the strange man who posed to be Veronica's cousin attacked me. After hearing my story, the cops claimed that I was lying and that I had killed my roommates. According to the cops and the detective, I returned to my dorm around 11 p.m., not around 1 a.m., as I claimed. I was so intoxicated that I had no clue what I was doing. Then I got into an argument with one of my roommates. This argument led to a big fight, which made me so angry that I picked up the kitchen knife and killed both of my roommates in their sleep a few hours later. And then on the way back to my room, I fell unconscious on the floor as I was drunk from the party. To prove their point, they asked me to take a closer look at my hands. As I looked at my hands, I could clearly see the light shade of red on my hands, and there was dark red color under my fingernails. It was blood. Probably the blood of my roommates. They said I was the murderer. I was the one who killed my roommates. But in the six months I had lived with them, we had never fought. So what would have me so angry that I killed them? Furthermore, the cops claimed that they found the murder weapon, the kitchen knife, near my unconscious body in our dorm. It had my fingerprints on it. Moreover, the man who I thought was Veronica's cousin sleeping on the sofa of our living room did not exist. I'm confused about whether he was really there or whether he was a fragment of my imagination to cope with what I had done. I do not think I am capable of such a heinous crime. Am I being framed or did I really kill my roommates?
What happened to me yesterday was the most horrifying experience I faced. I, as a person, who some people may consider as a workaholic, worked in two different jobs. I worked as a recruiter during the day and as a waitress at night. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I spent more time at my house as I was working remotely as a recruiter. The second job I have mentioned was a part-time job, so I was able to work and have some time to spare for myself. The only difficulty I was facing was the fact that I had to take a bus to the coffee shop I was working in. My shift would begin around 6 a.m., so it was not difficult to go there, but my shift would end at midnight. Thus, I would have to rush to the bus stop to return to my house. Even though I hated rushing to catch a bus, I liked my job. And I liked the fact that I would be outside even though it was midnight. Enjoying the chilling breeze of the night every night was therapeutic. Yesterday was just like the other days. I worked full-time as a recruiter at my house and went out when I finished my work. The coffee shop was not really crowded, and I spent most of the time chatting with my colleagues. As my shift ended, I quickly went to the bus stop. The bus stop was on a road that few cars or people would pass by. It could hardly be called a bus stop, as it was just an area with a bench and a sign. The metal bench was rusty, and the movement had graffiti on it. Considering that this bus stop was in an isolated location where only a few would wait, I could understand the dirtiness of it. I checked the time and realized that I had run faster than usual as I was there five minutes earlier than I usually am. As I started to wait for the bus to arrive, I saw a shadowy figure walking towards the bus stop. When he passed under the flickering streetlight, I was able to take a good look at him. He had his hoodie on, and his hands were in his pockets. He seemed young. He had a slight hump back, and he was strolling. I began to feel goosebumps as he approached the bus stop. It was the first time I saw someone else would take the bus from there. Around that time was enough to scare me, and his posture was only making things worse. As he came to the bus stop, he sat on the bench. I walked a little bit further to avoid being too close to him. Another minute passed. He began to whistle this unnerving melody. He whistled the same melody over and over again. After whistling for a minute, he stopped. At first, I was relieved that he had stopped. But the silence started to bother me. I felt like it was the silence before the storm. After several seconds of torturous silence, the man got up. He stood there still his hands in his pockets, opened his mouth, and started to let out a mournful well. He looked at me as he made the sound, slowly lifting his hands and pointing toward me. I was petrified. A drop of cold sweat fell from my forehead to the ground. He raised his other arm towards me and started to speak. The bus will not arrive. His low voice sent shivers down my spine. I was so scared that I could not move a single muscle. He started to approach slowly. The way he walked resembled a zombie. As he came right next to me, he began to observe me. Without touching me, he started to smell me. I can still remember the high-pitched, inhaling sound he made as he continued to smell me. You are one of us now, he whispered, while I could do nothing but experience that terrorizing moment. As he held my shoulders, very quickly my survival instincts kicked in, and I could move my muscles again. I pushed him as hard as I could. From the impact, he lost his balance and fell to the ground. Still making the horrible wailing sound, he grabbed my ankle. I panicked and kicked his head. My reaction made him angry as he tightened his grip. His fingernails stabbed my ankles as his grip got more forceful. I kicked for several times until he let go. He lay on the ground, holding his head while crying. You betrayed us, he said with a disappointed voice. I heard the sound of the bus coming closer, and I turned around to see if it was coming. I could not have been much happier to catch a bus quickly coming closer. We shall see each other again. 
the man whispered. I turned around to see him, but when I turned around, I could not see anyone. The bus stopped before me, and with a calming, whistling sound, its doors were open. As soon as I got on the bus, I started to speak with the driver and tell him what had happened. I could see the horror in his eyes as he said, You have seen the night whisperer. People that live here hear the welling sound of this creature, and some believe that it was coming from a ghost. It became an urban legend around here. So you are saying that the night whisperer was a man in a dark hoodie? I do not believe he was a man, dear. I think you have encountered a spirit. Obviously, I did not believe him, but I was still shocked by the recent incident. My body did not stop shaking for a couple of minutes. The driver tried his best to comfort me, and realizing that there were no other passengers on the bus, he offered to take me to a police station. I thanked him and accepted his offer. When I got off the bus, I rushed into the station. Officers saw me, and realizing my frightened state, directed their attention to me. They listened as I told them about the night whisperer, including the folk tales the driver told me. After listening to my story, they gave me a glass of water, and one of the officers began to speak. We started to receive complaints about the wailing sound around that area two months ago. At first, we did not focus on it as it seemed less important considering the other duties we had. But after a while, the complaints began to pile up and we knew that we had to check it out. We tried our best to find the source of the sound, but we could not find it. Then, we began to hear that children and women were disappearing. Another officer came next to us with some papers and a pen. She placed them on the table and listened as the other officer continued his speech. We started an investigation in the area. We have found some people like you that claim to be witnesses of the Night Whisperer, as they called it. The investigation is still ongoing, but we believe that a suspect is a man in his 20s with a mental disorder or a drug addiction. Either way, your report will be helpful for the investigation. I wrote what I went through in detail and left the station. As I was walking back to my house, in a shadowy corner of a back alley, I saw the figure again. I know where you live. They cannot save you, he shouted, and started to make the wailing sound. I ran back to the station and asked for protection. They told me that they could escort me to my place. They left me right in front of my house. As I went inside my house, I called my employer and told him that I wanted to quit my job as a waitress. Upon hearing what happened to me, he understandingly accepted my resignation. After that incident, I could not sleep nor go outside. I know it has only been a day after it, but I am scared that this trauma will haunt me for years. Even now, I can still hear the uncanny wail of the man. Looking out of my window, I sometimes see shapes shifting inside the shadows and feel in utter disturbance. I am getting more and more paranoid every hour. I cannot get rid of the feeling of being watched. I hope the police find the suspect as soon as possible, or I won't be able to survive going through these challenging days. Once upon a time, when there was more good in the world than evil, there was a kingdom under the ocean ruled by a ruthless king. He had several daughters, and each of these daughters helped the king in ruling his underwater kingdom. His youngest daughter, who was but sixteen, was sweet Ariel. She had long red hair and was the fairest of them all. The king ruled his kingdom with an iron fist and was a stern man. He knew that the people on the land were evil, and he trusted them the least. He warned all his daughters to never go anywhere near land. He always said that you're the safest here, underwater, in our kingdom. The ground folk are cruel and evil, and they'll do anything for wealth. But little Ariel often dozed off when her father gave these speeches. According to her, he repeated the same lecture so many times that by now each of her sisters had it by heart. But unlike her, each of her sisters always listened to their father and remained deep under the ocean where their father could protect them. 
Ariel, on the other hand, enjoyed the fresh air, the blue sky, and the flying birds. However, whenever she spotted a ship, she swam right back down to the depths of the ocean she called home. But as she grew older, she became bored with her mundane life as a sea princess. She was never involved in the ruling of the ocean like some of her elder sisters. She was just the little daughter of the king. Now at 17, Ariel wanted her freedom more than anything, and what better than the land to explore? So she finally decided to go up and explore the land. But on the night she decided to go ashore, she saw a wrecked ship on the far end of an island. She went near the ship and saw a handsome young man around her age, lying face first in the sand. It seemed like their ship had drowned near the island, and this man was swept ashore along with the wrecked parts of his ship. He is unconscious, and Ariel does everything in her power to wake him. The moment his blue eyes land on her, he is mesmerized to see a real-life mermaid, no less one so beautiful. Ariel hides behind a rock once he is fully awake, and once he assures her he won't hurt her, she finally comes in front of him. This is the first time Ariel had any interaction with a human, and the man before her wasn't at all cruel or evil. He seemed friendly, and he thanked her for saving his life. For the next several nights, Ariel met this handsome young man named Eric on the shore of that island. They spoke and laughed and enjoyed each other's company. One night, however, Eric said, Do you wish to see more of my world? The land has pretty fascinating things to offer, many beautiful places to see, several types of food to try, and the animals on the land are different too. Would you like to come with me? I love that, but I can't be out of the water for too long, or else I would die. That made Eric sad, and that's why it upset Ariel too. But instead of being sad and helpless, Eric had a solution. He may have the looks of a prince, but he was the son of a fisherman, so he knew a thing or two about keeping fish alive out of the sea. What if I put you in a water tank and show you all the pretty things in the world? That way you won't die and we can be together. Ariel, being the innocent girl that she was, thought it was the most brilliant idea and agreed to see the world with Eric. They decided to meet the next night on the same shore. Ariel had a small bag with her and was hiding behind a big rock waiting for Eric to arrive, and soon he did. Come here, my dear, he called out to her, and Ariel swam to him. But before she could say a word, a big fishing net fell on her from above. Two huge men stepped from behind tall palm trees and lifted her along with the net and put her in a big blue drum full of water. That drum was too small for her and she struggled to get out, all while screaming for Eric to help her. However, when she heard his conversation with the two thugs, her blood turned cold. Take the fish away and present her to the king. We will get a handsome amount of money in exchange for her. She will forever be caged in the king's aquarium, along with the other fish, and we will be on our way, far, far away from this place, Eric said, and the two men laughed in agreement with him. The moment she was loaded in a horse cart to be taken to the king, she knew she should have listened to her father and stayed in the ocean kingdom. That day she was presented in the king's court, and the king bought her for his aquarium by giving Eric and his companion a small fortune. After that, she was put in a big fish tank with other fish caught in the sea. Every animal in that tank was sad and deprived of its freedom. But Ariel had become the prime attraction. The land people had no idea that the merfolk really existed, and there were flocks of people like sheep gathered to get just a glimpse of her. The fish tank handlers poked her with long sticks and fed her rotten fish. Once, she was a princess, and now she had become a show doll. Indeed, the land people were as cruel as her father described them to be. Meanwhile, her absence was noted in the Sea Kingdom, and her father the king had sent his troops into the deepest and darkest corners of the ocean, only to return with no news of the princess. With no way to find his daughter, the king approached the sea witch, Ursula. She and the king had a long-standing rivalry, but she always favored all the princesses. When the king told her about the lost princess, 
She looked into her glass orb and saw an image of an imprisoned Ariel in a fish tank, surrounded by land people. The king was ready to raise revolt against the land folk to get his youngest daughter back, but Ursula had a better plan. She was the master of sorcery, and had a master plan. She waved her wand and cast a spell on Ariel, and instantly the mermaid in the tank lost her green tail and two legs appeared in its place. The tail was discarded as an artificial skin. When the king got to know about his mermaid being just a red-haired girl wearing a fake fishtail, he felt deceived and tricked. He let Ariel go and sent his soldiers to look for Eric, the fisherman, and his two companions. The king's soldiers caught the trio and brought them before the king, who beheaded all three for tricking him. Ariel rushed to the sea and jumped inside. The moment her body was submerged into the ocean, her fishtail reappeared and she was reunited with her family. The Sea King was happy to have his little princess back in his kingdom, safely where she belonged. In this story, Ursula turned out to be the helpful witch, and Eric was the evil one. People always laugh when I tell them I have sacrophobia. It's not a common phobia, so you probably haven't heard of it but it's basically the fear of sweet things. Now, I know that sounds dumb, as why would someone be afraid of something as amazing as candy and chocolate? But after hearing about this gruesome experience, you too will think twice about shoving a piece of candy down your throat. I remember as a kid, I really loved sweets. I can't forget the first time I tasted a bright red lollipop, and to me, it tasted like the sweetest thing on earth. After that experience, I would hoard sweets in my mouth any chance I got. I literally became obsessed with them, as I'd take them after breakfast, after lunch, and after dinner. Even though I loved doing this, my mom wasn't too keen on it, as my oral hygiene was horrible and that led to numerous dentist visits. Due to the excessive amount of sugar I was taking in, it didn't take long before my teeth started to hurt and I eventually started going to the dentist regularly. I really hated going to the dentist, and it wasn't because I was scared of them, no. It was because of the way my dentist, Mr. Dorian, treated me. The first time I met him, I knew something was wrong, as he had a really weird aura. I remember telling my mom, I really don't want to do this, and she told me, well, if you didn't eat sweets all the time, Holly, we wouldn't have to be here. It didn't take long before Dr. Dorian walked up to me and my mom. I smiled at him, and when he saw my teeth, he looked at me with disgust. I didn't think much of it at first, but every time I went back, he always treated me the same way. He always had the same disgusted look on his face as he looked at me like I was a filthy thing and I irritated him. Dr. Dorian also seemed psychotic, as he usually had little tremors every time he saw my teeth. He would also say the weirdest things, as he used to tell me, You don't deserve what you've been given. You treat your teeth horribly, and one of these days they will fall out. I tried to tell my mom everything that was going on, but she just brushed them off, as she thought I was making them up to get out of going to the dentist. Every time I complained, she would respond with, Stop being difficult, Holly, and stop lying to me. If you don't want to go to the dentist, stop eating sweets. I wasn't ready to give up sweets, and while I hated Dr. Dorian, I didn't let him get to me as I kept eating whatever I wanted. As I grew older, things only got worse. I still didn't care what my mom or Dr. Dorian said, as I kept to my sugar-filled diet, and once I was able to, I began to dodge my dentist appointments. I remember my teeth getting so bad, they began to hurt, but I still didn't care, as all I wanted to do was just to eat more and more sweets, so I ate through the pain. Eventually, my mom found out, and she forced me to go to Dr. Dorian. She dropped me off herself that day, and I remember screaming at her on the way there, as I told her, There's something wrong with him, Mom. Can you please listen to me? But all my pleas fell on deaf ears 
as she still dropped me off. I remember going into Dr. Dorian's office, and it was awfully quiet, as no other people were there. I walked in to see Mr. Dorian standing in the middle of the room, waiting for me. As soon as I saw him, I knew something was wrong. Because remember how I said earlier that he always looked irritated every time he saw me? This time, he was eerily calm. Dr. Dorian then told me in a calm voice, You arrogant, unfixable child. You have no idea what you have. Not all of us are as lucky as you to have a complete set of teeth. And seeing as you don't care about them, I will take them away from you. I was taken aback and freaked out by the statement. And as I started to say, What do you mean? He lunged at me. Before I could move, his hands were around my throat. He violently threw me into a chair, and my head hit something hard. I was paralyzed for a few seconds as I watched him strap my hands down before prying my mouth open with the mouth prop. I tried screaming, but with my mouth pried open with the mouth prop, I couldn't really make much sound. I watched him get out a hammer and a chisel that was wrapped in a bloody cloth. I remember him walking up to me and placing the chisel at the base of my incisors. He then screamed the words, Say goodbye to your precious teeth. And as the hammer connected to the base of the chisel, I felt immeasurable pain ripple through my jaw. I screamed as I felt a tooth roll down my tongue and into my throat. Dr. Dorian who now had a psychotic look in his eyes, kept screaming the words, Do you now understand what you had? Do you now see what you should have done? But on the bright side, you can now have all the candy you want, you greedy child. As he hammered down again, I began to choke and writhe in pain as he whispered into my ear, A toothless life is a painful life. And you'll soon experience that, my sweet Holly. My gums, my head, and every part of my body hurt. I could feel my mouth and my jaw throb in immense pain. But even through all this, all that was going through my mind were the words, I really don't want to die. I started to frantically look around for something, anything I could use to get myself free. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw some sharp dentist tools on a platter that was right next to the chair I was tied to. Instinctively, I reached out to it, but my hands were still restrained. I knew that if I didn't do something, the psychopathic dentist would kill me by morbidly breaking all my teeth out. So I began to profusely pull at my restraints. It really hurt to struggle, but I continued to pull and soon enough, I heard a little pop sound as I felt waves of pain ripple through my body. I had twisted my wrist, but I was free. And without thinking, I grabbed what seemed to be a scaler, and as he was about to use after putting myself together, I eventually told them everything that happened. When I was done relaying the incident, I was curious as to what Dr. Dorian had against me, so I remember asking them, do you guys know why he did this to me? The cops then proceeded to tell me all they had found out about Dr. Dorian throughout their investigation, as they said, Miss Files stated he had periodontitis. It's also known as periodontal disease or gum disease. It's a terrible disease that causes all your teeth to fall out. Apparently, he had gotten it at a very young age, which led him to lose all his teeth, as he, too, had dental implants. Apparently, that's why he devoted his life to being a dentist and taking care of other people's teeth. But due to the severe trauma of losing his teeth as a child, he developed some severe mental issues, which led him to go overboard with the obsession of preserving teeth. As they spoke, things began to click in my head as I finally understood why Dr. Dorian acted that way whenever he saw my teeth and why he was so adamant on fixing my bad oral hygiene. I also realized that he saw me as a spoilt and greedy kid 
and even though I was, there was no excuse for what he did to me. The officer then continued with, This clinic has been closed down so that no one would ever experience what you went through. I then asked the cops, And what about Dr. Dorian? Is he all right? They didn't answer my question as they just stood up to leave. I tried to pry, but my mom held my hand and told me not to persist. Till today, I still don't know whether I killed him or if he's still alive. And in any way, I prefer that as the uncertainty. Let me keep a bit of my sanity. It's been seven years since this incident, and I haven't eaten any sweet treats like candy or chocolate ever since. To be honest, it's not that I don't want to, but every time I try to, I'm taken back there. To the day my teeth were forcefully taken from me, and that always leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. A taste I know I'll keep for the rest of my life. So I did the first thing that popped into my mind and bolted. I ran all the way to my house and locked the door behind me. My mom saw me and asked, Emily, what's wrong? Did you get your ice cream? I avoided the questions and told her I was fine and wasn't in the mood for ice cream. That night, I lay in bed, thinking about what happened that afternoon, and went to bed with only one thing on my mind. Was this all just a misunderstanding? Or was there someone in danger, locked in Mr. Nicky's truck? And if so, who was it? Throughout the following week, I avoided Mr. Nicky's truck as I was still scared due to the incident. It must have been obvious something was going on, as my mom soon realized something was wrong. I remember her asking, Is everything all right at school, Emily? So I responded with, Everything is fine, Mom. And even though I tried to hide it, she knew I wasn't telling her everything. Eventually, she stopped asking questions and left me alone. With every passing day, I delved deeper into my thoughts and I soon realized my mind was constantly fixated on what had happened, and the uncertainty had begun to constantly eat at me. I couldn't live like this, and I knew I had to find out whatever it was, and there was only one way to find out. So, I strengthened my resolve, and finally decided on what I had to do. The next day, when I got back from school, I quietly slipped out of the house and made my way to Mr. Nicky's van. I had gotten an ice cream cone, but as usual, it was really crowded and busy, so amidst all the rowdiness, I found my way to the back of the truck. The doors were closed, so I stood there and decided to wait and see if I would see or hear anything, and I prayed I wouldn't. Minutes passed and nothing happened. As I stood there, I began to wonder if I was wrong all this time, if I hadn't actually heard any screams and it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I also began to think back to all the times I had associated with Mr. Nicky. He always seemed like a nice and upright man who would never do anything to hurt anyone. After standing there for about half an hour with my thoughts, I eventually gave up. And since I didn't hear anything, I had gotten the closure I desperately wanted. I turned my back to leave, but that's when I heard the doors of the truck were about to be opened. So... I quickly hid. Mr. Nicky emerged from the back of the truck. He was taking out what seemed to be the trash, and as he walked down the streets to where our garbage cans were, I noticed the door was slightly left ajar. I knew I had heard nothing while I was waiting, but I just had to look and finally clear all doubts. So, I walked forward and peeked into the van. It was pretty dark inside, and I couldn't see much, so... I decided to get in and take a better look, and with both fists clenched, I walked in. The inside of the van looked like a small room, but I couldn't make out my surroundings well, as there was only a little light coming in from outside, so I decided to take out my phone and use its flashlight to look around. As I fumbled around in my pockets for my phone, I felt myself step on something hard. It snapped under the pressure of my weight, and I thought I stepped on a stick. I finally turned on the flashlight, 
and pointed it to the floor to see what I stepped on. I saw I accidentally knocked down a box and the things inside were spilled out on the floor. At first glance, I knew they weren't sticks as they had a faded white color on them. And as I peered into the box, I saw what seemed to be little bones. I assumed they were dog bones as they were far too small to be those of a human being. But that was until I saw the numerous little skulls and with one look at them, a horrific realization dawned on me. There was no mistaking, it was clearly human skulls. They were too little to be that of an adult, so I immediately recognized that these skulls belonged to babies. I held myself from screaming as I began to back away. I hadn't taken more than four steps back before I bumped into something. I then quickly turned to see three women whose hands were hung to the ceiling by chains. They were blindfolded and gagged, and they weren't wearing any tops or blouses, and what seemed to be breast pumps were attached to their breasts. It was a truly messed up sight, as it looked like these women were being milked like cows. A slew of emotions hit me at once, and a sick feeling formed in my stomach almost immediately. But before I could scream, the lights came on, and I heard Mr. Nicky's voice say, I see you found my friends, Emily. I slowly turned around to see a crazy-looking Mr. Nicky staring at me with a sickening smile on his face. The room was properly lit now, and I could see everything clearly. It was then I noticed one of the women hanging from the roof was pregnant. But please, Mr. Nicky... What is this? Who are these women? These were the words I blurted out while walking deeper into the truck and away from Mr. Nicky. Mr. Nicky then responded with, These women are my friends who have willingly decided to give me their gift so I can use it as my secret ingredient. I was confused, shocked, and baffled at the same time as I didn't understand what he was saying. He then continued with, Be grateful, Emily, because it's by their wonderful generosity I am able to use their gift to create my wonderful but also nutritious ice cream taste, the same one you had not too long ago. He spoke like he was advertising his sick methods, and for the first time, Mr. Nicky looked truly psychotic. I noticed him look at the floor to where the skeletons were scattered as he said, Oh, you also found my children. You've been busy, haven't you, Emily? At first, I felt even more confused. But soon enough, everything clicked. The horrific realization dawned on me as I stepped farther away from him screaming at the top of my lungs. Mr. Nicky then said, I see, you finally understand. You know, Mama always said, Mother's milk is the best, and she was right. It was always delicious, nutritious, and the key to healthy living. So I knew I had to use it in my very own ice cream recipe, but I had to make them mothers first in order to get the milk, and I had no time to be a father. You understand, don't you, Emily? Completely scared now, I stuttered. Why are you telling me all this? So he responded with, Don't be silly, Emily. I'm telling you because there are no secrets between friends. Before I could move, he threw himself at me and tried to stop my struggling. I could feel his breath against my skin and him feeling my body parts. His smell utterly irritated me and I shoved my knee at his groin. He immediately God. fell off me saying, You bitch! You fucking bitch! And with no hesitation, I bolted. And I ran all the way home. I got home and I told my mom everything that happened. So she immediately called the cops. But when the cops arrived, they couldn't find Mr. Nicky. No one could. It was like he had completely vanished. The incident traumatized me for the rest of my childhood. But with a lot of therapy, I moved on.
I still, however, always jump at the sound of an ice cream truck. As I know, Mr. Nicky is still out there, spreading and sharing his special ice cream. Knowing I once partook of it still nauseates me to this day. But I take solace in the fact that I am not the only one, because any one of you hearing this story may have already partaken in Mr. Nicky's special healthy living ice cream. My mom has never missed a Sunday Mass since her childhood. She is a person who loves to help others. Since I was two, she took me to church with her. My father is an atheist, and although he supports and loves us, he never accompanies us to the Sunday Mass. As a toddler, I remember hating the idea of sitting still on a bench in a room full of people, listening to an old man. Sunday Mass was boring. Instead, I wanted to play in the park. So, to make me go with her every Sunday, my mom told me that she would give me ice cream after the Mass was over from my favorite ice cream shop in the town. The thought of having an ice cream every week made me give in to her offer. And that's how I ended up attending the Sunday Mass every week. This happened when I was around 13 or 14. And after this incident, I never asked my mom for an ice cream after the Sunday Mass ever again. There is something I have to tell you about my mom. She is an anxious driver. She hates to drive and only drives when it is necessary. My dad drove us almost everywhere, but Mom had to drive to the church every Sunday as Dad never did. It's not like my mom is a bad driver. She is just extra cautious and anxious about driving, especially during the night. The Mass usually began around 3 in the afternoon and ended around 5 or 5.30 in the evening. We then went to the ice cream shop, had our ice creams, and drove home before the sunset, so she didn't have to drive in the dark. We live in a rural town, and when I was a young teenager, there were dirt roads all around the town, and there were hardly any headlights. That day, the mass started a little late, and ended even later than we anticipated. I was in my rebellious teenager phase, so when my mom asked me to skip the ice cream, I refused. I told her she had promised me an ice cream treat and she must fulfill it. Even though it was still pretty lit outside, I knew that by the time we finish our ice creams, it would get dark, and mom would have to drive home in pitch blackness with only the headlights illuminating our way. But as I mentioned, I just didn't care enough, and I really, really wanted to eat ice cream. We both made our way to the ice cream shop, sat in a booth, and ordered our regular. We ate the ice cream, and I could sense my mom getting anxious with every passing minute as it got darker and darker outside. Finally, we paid the bill, and Mom got behind the wheel and me in the passenger seat. A dirt road led to our home from the ice cream shop. Although Mom had driven on this road countless times, still she was on high alert as the sun had set and it was getting darker. The dirt road did not have any houses on either side of it until we reach our neighborhood. It was just a stretch of seven miles with dense forest on both sides of the road. My mom drove about two miles, and as we were driving, I just looked at my mom grabbing the steering wheel with her hands and not taking her eyes off the road, even for a second. Outside her window, I saw a little girl sitting on the edge of the forest. For a moment, I was confused, but I was pretty sure I saw a girl, so I told my mom. 
Hey, Mom, there was a little girl out there. She did not respond as she was so engrossed in driving that she had not heard me. I repeated the same thing, and this time she looked at me and said, What do you mean there's a girl? It's literally in the middle of the forest, Julie. Are you sure you saw a girl? Yes, Mom, I'm damn sure. We must go and check in on her. The last rays of the sun had already left the sky, and it was evident that if we turned around, we would reach home only after it was dark. But my mom never walked away from a person who needed help, so she took a U-turn, and we were back to the spot where I had seen the girl. Due to the lack of streetlights, it was tough to spot the girl. So my mom aimed the headlights toward the exact place where I had seen the little girl. And sure enough, at a distance of about five meters, we could see the girl. The little girl was wearing a baby pink nightgown, and her legs tucked to her chest and was rocking back and forth with her face looking downwards. My mom was shocked when she saw the girl. It was very unlikely to see someone here at this time, let alone a child. Instead of approaching the girl, my mom and I decided to slowly drive past her and see what she was up to. Our town was a very close community, so it was unusual to see a kid we did not recognize in the middle of a country road at night. As we drove past her, we expected her to acknowledge the car that was slowly creeping in on her. A normal person would at least look up and see who was in the car. My mom and I meant no harm to the girl. But when our car passed by her, she did not react. Just kept on rocking back and forth. Moreover, the girl wasn't a kid as we had assumed she was a teenager about my age. When we reached a few meters ahead of where this girl was, we could not see her in the rearview mirror. It was spooky, to be honest. But we both blamed it on the darkness. My mother was concerned about this girl, so we decided to take a U-turn again. But this time, my mom was going to talk to the teenage girl. However, when we turned around, the girl was gone. No matter how much we tried to spot her, she was nowhere to be seen. My mom and I decided that we should go home and call the cops and report the incident instead of staying there all by ourselves. It was so dark, the only source of light were our headlights. Now, let me tell you the spot where we saw this girl was about two miles away from the ice cream shop. After about ten minutes, we had covered about four miles and were at an intersection which led to our neighborhood, and down the road, about a mile away, was our home. When we reached the intersection, there were no cars or people around. However, on the other side of that intersection was a girl eerily similar to the one we had just seen on our way back. This time, she was not sitting. Instead, she was standing with her head down and her hair covering her face. I was scared shitless, and I could see that my mom was struggling to keep her cool, too. Mom? Is it the same girl? Yes, darling, I think so too. But how did she... My mom did not have to complete the sentence for me to know what she meant. We both were thinking the same exact thing. How did the girl get so far so fast? It was a four-mile stretch, which was impossible for a person to cover on foot so fast. 
I immediately had a very bad feeling about it. My mom, however, still wished to help the girl, so she started driving toward the girl. I, on the other hand, was freaking out. Mom, please don't drive towards the girl. Let's just go home. It's dark. Dad must be worried. Please, Mom, please, let's go home. Please. I kept on begging, but my mom did not listen to me and kept on driving toward the girl. At one point, I was so terrified that instead of sitting on the seat, I crouched on the footrest, covered my ears, and shut my eyes. The girl was standing on my side of the car, and so I didn't make any attempt to roll down the windows. My mom had asked me a couple of times to roll the windows down, but I refused, so she grabbed the knob and rolled the windows down herself, so the teenager outside could hear her voice. Hey, kid, do you need any help? My mom yelled at that girl, but as soon as she said that, my mom sped up the car and was driving so fast that I immediately knew something was off. I looked at my mom and she was covering her mouth with her hand and clutching the steering with one. I sat on the seat and quietly asked her, Mom, what's wrong? At first, she was so shocked, she just looked at me and tears were running down her eyes. She couldn't speak and just kept on driving as she could. Mind you, she never drove that fast and definitely not at night. I asked her the same question again. This time, all she said was, The girl had no face. It was hollow. This stopped my heart for a single beat and I was so stunned that I just sat there hoping we would reach home quickly. As soon as we reached home, we barged into the main door, and Dad asked us what the matter was. We narrated the entire incident to him, and he decided to call the cops and asked them to scout the area for a teenage girl. The cops were out all night scanning the area in hopes of finding a girl, but deep down my mom and I knew that they would not find her. Thereof, we never had ice cream after the mass and drove home as soon as the mass ended while it was still bright outside. We never encountered the girl again and, to date, we have no explanation for what we saw. But at the bottom of our hearts, we both know that we had narrowly escaped something evil that evening. For the last year, I've been a regular viewer of this channel. And let me tell you how happy I get when a new video pops up in my notification. I know a lot of you can relate to this. Being a truck driver, most of the time I'm on the road. These videos and music keep me entertained throughout my drives. But today, I'm going to share a true night driving horror story with you. And I hope you enjoy it. My name is Stefan, and for the past eight years I've been a truck driver. I always enjoyed driving and being on the road, so when I was approached by my uncle to work as a driver in his transportation company, I jumped at the opportunity. I'm also a part of the truck driving community, and we all share our good as well as bad or terrifying experiences with each other. I too had seen my fair share of sketchy and illegal things on the road, but what happened to me that one time made me question everything. The company that I work for transports electronic goods, furniture, and other non-perishable items most of the time. There was one such delivery I had to do from South Carolina to North Dakota. It was December, so the atmosphere was already chilly, and driving through snow-covered roads is not my favorite part. However, I was requested to make this delivery by my uncle, as the other driver had taken a sick leave. I reluctantly accepted to drive the goods on one condition, that I would drive slowly and take my time delivering them. 
My uncle happily agreed as the company was soon to be closing for Christmas. In my trucker's community, I have a lot of drivers that had mentioned weird things happening on the way to North Dakota. Although I listened to all of them, I never really believed in the supernatural or the paranormal. I always thought those things were a result of your mind playing tricks on you. Not to mention the road life can be extremely lonely at times. On my third day of the drive, there was a snowstorm warning. I was just on the outskirts of North Dakota and had to call it a day. I always avoid driving in rough weather. Better to be late than dead. But this snowstorm was a hell of a lot worse than the ones I'd dealt with before. I'd planned to find truck parking and spend my time there, but the weather didn't permit me to go any further than a couple of miles. Finally defeated and tired of making my way through the snow-covered roads, I parked in a small clearing by the freeway. There was no chance I was getting out of the truck. Also, the sun was about to set, so I knew it would be pitch black soon. I did my regular drill, checked the back doors of the trailer and make sure everything was locked up, made sure all the tires weren't covered in snow, and locked the driver's and passenger side door. Boarded up the front glass with a blackout curtain that I carry with me, and I shut the windows. I knew I had to keep the heating on in my truck if I wanted to sleep comfortably. Plus, I had to make dinner. By the time it was dark outside, I had eaten my dinner, a simple sandwich, relieved myself, and was ready to get some shut-eye. I lay in the makeshift bed behind the driver's and passenger seat, pulled a blanket over myself, and got comfortable. I knew it'd take a few minutes to fall asleep, so I decided to watch some of SSG Animation's scary videos on YouTube. I'm not sure when I fell asleep, but I jolted awake after hearing a sudden bang. It was as if someone had hit something hard and big against the rear of my truck. My phone was beside my bed and it was dark, inside and out. My first instinct was that maybe I'd had a dream, so I decided to go back to sleep only to be woken up by another bang a couple minutes later. This time, however, I knew I wasn't dreaming. Someone, or something, was banging on my truck, and they were hitting hard against the steel. I had a couple of incidents of homeless people or straight-up thieves trying to steal stuff from my parked truck. But who would get here in the middle of the snowstorm with two or three feet of snow everywhere? Bang! Once again... Who the hell was it? I knew it was intentional as no wild animal ever targets a big object repeatedly and never in a snowstorm. But who would be daring enough to get out here in such a remote place and at that ungodly hour just to torment a truck driver? If it weren't snowing so much, I'd step out and confront the person or people. I always carried a small gun with me, just in case. So I wasn't afraid. But this time, something in my gut told me to stay inside and not react. However, I was curious, so I decided to film whatever was going on through my window. With my phone camera, I moved over from my bed to get closer to the window. As soon as I pointed my camera towards the exterior of the truck, I saw weird yellow eyes staring straight at me from the corner of my window. I was so scared that I stumbled back into my bed. I didn't make a single sound, as the only thing keeping me safe from the creature outside was the truck door and some breakable glass. I knew as soon as I saw the eye that this was no wolf or bear, nor was this any human or any animal for that matter. It was something else, something we didn't know about. I stayed tucked in my bed and kept recording as much as I could. Soon I spotted an ear of the creature, all while the bang continued. This meant there was more than one of these creatures. I knew I didn't stand a chance in front of one of these guys, not even with my gun, so the wise thing was to lay low and hope they'd leave me alone. Also, the battery of my phone was about to die, so I stopped recording and curled myself back in bed. Now the creatures were moving to the front of the truck, and I was terrified. I knew the only one who could save my life from the terrifying creatures outside was God. So I started praying while I hid beneath my blanket. 
The creatures banged on the doors and the hood of the truck. They were trying to open the doors to get in, but I had double locked them. A locking technique I'd learned very early on in my trucking career. Now, without my phone, I wasn't able to see anything outside. All I could do was hear the noises made by these creatures. This went on for at least an hour, after which the creatures got bored of my truck and left. That night, I didn't sleep one bit. I was wide awake in case the creatures returned, but they never did. The next morning after sunrise, I scouted the surroundings from the inside of my truck, and when I thought the coast was clear, I jumped out of the truck. I jumped straight into four feet of snow. There were no footprints on the ground for me to figure out if it was a human or an animal. However, as I moved towards the back of the truck, there were multiple dents in the steel, which resembled a powerful punch. Not scratched from an animal's paw or horns, but a human punch. Who would be strong enough to put such deep dents into a steel truck? I had no idea, but I decided to get the hell out of that place as soon as I could. Finally, I reached my destination by midday, and fortunately, the snow on the road had melted and the weather was pleasant. The people unloading the stuff from my truck had asked if I'd gotten into an accident, looking at all the dents on it. I told them what had happened, and they told me that no one dares to travel on that part of the freeway after sunset, and the people living in that region believe that a half-human, half-animal hybrid roams that area after sundown and attacks anything and any one who comes across it. To date, no one has been able to catch or even get a photo of this animal as it's as smart as a human and as strong as an animal. Then, I showed the footage on my phone, and perhaps that was the only time someone had captured those creatures on camera. I don't know if I should consider myself lucky or extremely lucky. What do you think those things were? Werewolves? Humanoids or aliens? I, for one, have no clue what they were, and nor do I ever want to know.